uh, Boston Celtics uh, defeated uh, New Orleans Pelicans in uh, TD Garden uh, tonight, 117 and 108. Uh, we are here uh, to uh, break down the games for you. Uh, we are we are we are here uh, to talk about the latest uh, rumors, and we are here to uh, talk about uh, the last uh, two. Uh, Celtics games uh, too, and the wins uh, against uh, the great wins against uh, Utah Jazz and uh, uh, Philadelphia uh, 70 76ers. Uh, so, after losing uh, in New Orleans from the same opponents, uh, New Orleans Pelicans, if I'm correct, 106 105, uh, this is uh, one of the worst. Um, one of the worst uh, losses in the season uh, for me, um, in my opinion, uh, that lo uh, loss uh, from the Pelicans uh, in uh, New Orleans, because uh, those are the games that the Celtics uh, should win. And after losing that game, the Celtics now got their... Um, uh, their revenge. It was uh, one great professional win tonight in TD Garden 107, uh, 108. And now in the season series against uh, New Orleans uh, Pelicans, the Celtics are 1-1. One and one. At the same time, the Celtics are 3-0 uh, between our last show, 153rd that took place in uh, um, in uh, at blogtalkradio.com uh, 1st January 7 p.m. Eastern. You can listen uh, 153rd show at blogtalkradio.com Celtics Talk Radio, and of course you can find us at our pages Weebly Green Celtics Fans Forum, Celtics Talk Radio official Facebook page, Celtics Talk Radio Twitter page, STR capital letters. Celtics Talk Radio, small letters, and connected them um, at the Instagram, and now the brand new Celtics Talk Radio YouTube channel. Subscribe, and we are going to upload those live video sets that we are doing from time to time. And this is episode number two of our live video chat. And also, you can listen us uh, to the, through the iTunes and. Um, just Google Celtics Talk Radio at the iTunes, okay? Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, between um, our uh, between our um, uh, two uh, shows, I mean between our uh, radio show and uh, between uh, this uh, video chat, the Celtics played the three games that we are going to uh, recap. Uh, the the First game is uh, this evening uh, against uh, New Orleans Pelicans. Like I said, we are uh, one and one in the uh, season series uh, against uh, the Pelicans. And uh, last night, uh, in one uh, excited, exciting uh, and uh, uh, interesting clash, actually uh, the tight, the tight and tight game um, that came to the uh, final. Uh, Two minutes. Uh, we defeated uh, in one very important game, uh, Philadelphia 76ers, and uh, we are, if I'm correct, 2 0 against them uh, right now in the season series. And uh, prior to that, um, in the first game in 2017 year, uh, we defeated one very um, solid and good uh, team, uh, Utah Jazz 115 104. In Utah Jazz game, 115-104, Isaiah Thomas, 29 points, 15 uh, assists, uh, excellent, amazing, after coming from that uh, uh, career record game, 52 points against Miami Heat, December 30th, the Isaiah Thomas uh, continued the, the streak of 21-plus uh, 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 points games, and this time he... Um, Scored 29 points and generated 15 assists. 
amazing. Kelly Olenek 7 rebounds, and Friday, January 6th, we played uh, Philadelphia 76ers in TD Garden, 110-106, 26 points from Ivory Bradley, 8 assists from Marcus Smart, and Alcorn for 12 rebounds, excellent performance, um, and if I'm correct, 14 points. Uh, the last, this evening, uh, we are going to recap the first game against New Orleans Pelicans in TD Garden, 117-108, Isaiah Thomas, 38 points, Al for them, 8 assists and 7 rebounds. And Happy New Year to you all. Um, uh, if you're uh, watching us for the first time, uh, welcome to the show. And um, I will give uh, the word to uh, Danny to tell you about uh, our new uh, YouTube channel and the shows that we are doing. Danny? Okay, Igor. Well, again, we uh, just started this. This is our second video overall um, that uh, we're going to be that we're doing here. The first one we did, we uh, only managed to get it to go onto YouTube. Uh, this website that we're using right now, which is the US Stream, is uh, basically allowing us to go live. So if you are watching us via that website, which we put the links up, you can see us talking. Uh, me wearing the John Cena shirt, Igor on the TV here in my basement. Um, we're using a couple devices. Um, I'm using my Xbox One to allow Igor to be seen over the television, which is something that not even Igor was aware of. He thought I was using a laptop, um, but I decided to try something a little bit different this time around, which allows me to have a laptop here on my side to look up the stats, stats should I say, and make it a little bit easier. And then a second laptop is being used to help us record the video of me and Igor so that we can upload it to YouTube. So if you're someone that wants to talk about the Celtics game tonight against Anthony Davis and the Pelicans or any of the other games, as of late, or any of the other discussions that Igor and me might bring up, possibly the um, all-star discussions, the, the yeah. last discussions with the trade rumors, with Paul Millsap, even maybe the discussion of Jay Crowder's actions as of late and his way of going off on the fans. Yeah. If you have any thoughts yeah. about that, you can talk to us via our Facebook group, which is the Weebly Green Celtics Fan Forum. We have the post pinned. You can comment on that post, or you can go to our Twitter accounts and message us through there, and we can basically answer your questions or read out loud your comments if you basically want to get your own opinions on our discussions heard loud over the YouTube channel, which is now the Celtics Talk Radio YouTube channel, which we will be uploading these video chats throughout the rest of the season onto that new YouTube account. Excellent stuff, Danny. And um, uh, let's back to business uh, right now. Isaiah Thomas uh, uh, at uh, NBA t uh, TV uh, studio. Uh, I will definitely see you all in New Orleans, um, in Atlanta. The All-Star Game is uh, in New Orleans, said Isaiah Thomas to NBA studio to Atlanta, uh, at Atlanta. Uh, and the All-Star is uh, in New Orleans the next month. And uh, I'm using opportunity to... Uh, <clears throat> Tell you all uh, to vote for our players, right, Danny? And uh, those are Isaiah Thomas, uh, uh, which finished, uh, I think, fourth among the guards at the East, uh, and uh, uh, Ivory Bradley, um, and Al for the uh, for the forwards. Uh, so uh, let's get back to business. Uh, uh, 2017 year, uh, Danny, and uh, the three uh, wins. When you look at the standings. Uh, you see the very nice, uh, um, you know, picture. The Cleveland number one, 2017, 27 wins, eight losses. Toronto number two at uh, East, 24, 11. Toronto number one, Atlantic Division two, 68.6 percent. And Boston Celtics number three, East, and number two, Atlantic, 23 and 14, 62.2 uh, percent. Two games away from Toronto. But Toronto uh, played 35 games and uh, Boston played uh, 37 games. So um, the next game is uh, uh, Tuesday against Toronto. Um, and uh, uh, the game is uh, in Air Canada Center, Toronto, January 10th, 7.30 uh, p.m. Eastern. It will be an uh, important and exciting game. And Atlanta is number four. At the East, uh, 20, 
uh, and 1655.6. Uh, Charlotte Hornets number um, six, uh, number five, 20 wins, 17 losses, uh, 40, uh, 54 uh, percent. Uh, number six, Indiana, 20 and 18, 52.6 percent. Number seven, Milwaukee, 18 and 17, 51 percent. And number eight, Chicago, 18 and um, 18. Uh, when we talk uh, about our New Orleans Collins, um, they are uh, 14 and 24, 36.8% uh, out of the playoff uh, zone. So first impressions uh, from those uh, three games, Danny, 3-0, uh, uh, three, and all, uh, three professional wins. Uh, I don't care. Um, un 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 unlike majority of the Celtics fans, I, I don't like uh, too, I don't care too much right now about the performance. All I want is the wins. And the win is the win uh, is the win, and uh, the Celtics took care of um, the business and protected the home court. And uh, they're uh, two games away from Toronto, number two, and two games uh, played more, which means that Toronto can go three games uh, more than us if they win, but they will not, hopefully, in in in, in Tuesday. And if we win in Tuesday, we can even get closer. So. Your impressions? Well, I mentioned it uh, on our last video chat and on the last Celtics Talk radio radio show itself that uh, these games right now, the games the Celtics must win, there was no excuse for it if they were to lose because right now this is where the Celtics schedule was going to get way more easier than what they've had. You know, we can't, you know, you want to say that we basically can't expect this team to win against Toronto and Cleveland and all these other teams that are at the top of the league, fine. So if you can't win against them, then you got to make sure you take advantage of the teams that are below you in the standings to make sure you stay as high as possible in the playoff picture for the end of the season. So like that, you're almost guaranteed to get the home court advantage in round one and in this case, get a better first round matchup. So the Celtics going at it. You know, as you mentioned, 115 104 against the Utah Jazz, 110 106 over Philly, and 117 108 over the Pelicans. Those are three teams that you basically needed to beat because they sh should not be beating you whatsoever. The Pelicans, as you mentioned, beat us earlier, earlier this year by one point in a game that we yeah. didn't have Jay Crowder or Al Horford in. So that explains it right there why we ended up losing that game. And then today you beat them without Avery Bradley. So that shows you that one of those guys, Crowder or Horford, play in that game. You don't need both, and you probably end up beating them on their home court. So Celtic fans got to, you know, at least accept it. You know, right now you want this team to go up. It, right now this season is all about basically getting as good of a record as possible to try and make as far of a run as possible, even if you don't win it all. Try to get at least through two rounds or at least to game seven against Toronto in round two to try and get the free agents to actually look at you as a destination they might be willing to come, come to. Because if you start losing to teams like this, Utah, Philly, and New Orleans, and you fall in the standings, you just might see yourself being eliminated in round one, and that's not going to make any free agents want to come to you at the end of the season. Uh, excellent point, and I'm uh, telling this because, uh, Danny, uh, I mean, I'm talking uh, this uh, because uh, uh, you know that uh, there is always the fans that are not satisfied. You know, uh, the comments are beginning, I'm reading the comments, the comments are beginning, yes, we won, but the player X played bad. Yes, we won, but the player uh, X did this. Did that. I mean, the win is the win is the win. At, at the end of the season, who will remember? Uh, I mean, uh, we will remember, for example, that um, Al Horford uh, missed a game winning uh, layup uh, at, uh, uh, against the Thunder in Oklahoma. But uh, who will remember those little details? Anyway, the Celtics over last eight games, the last game not included, 114.9 points per 100 possession, which would lead the NBA this season. Isaiah Thomas last eight games, this game not included, 
33.3 points per game, 7.5 assists per game, 51.6% field goal. 51.6% field goal. And the Celtics are now the second team uh, that um, hit uh, 17 threes in uh, three straight games per uh, basketball references. Um, had straight this season um, because against the Utah, uh, if I'm correct, we have we had um, 17 threes scored made, and against Philly, we broke Crunchy's record in 19 scored threes, and tonight we had <clears throat> 18 threes, um, which is showing us that. Uh, it is raining trees. So, I mean, <laughs> that is just our style of playing. I don't like, but we are living and dying by the three, from the three points line. So, what what, what is your take on, on that then? Well, unfortunately, it's kind of been like that all season. This team has basically fallen in love with a three-point shot. You know, it's the entire starting lineup, other than Amir Johnson, is basically doing nothing but shooting three-pointers. Amir, you know, lives more in the paint, but even he's capable of hitting a three-pointer at times. But today, as you mentioned, they hit 18 out of 36, so that's 50%. If you could tell me that they'll shoot 50% 50, 50 from beyond the arc in a game, then I'll take that every night, knowing that technically, especially in a game like tonight where you got a guy like Anthony Davis on the floor for the other team, knowing that he's someone that's, you know, he's one of those guys that is, that's a lot like Shaquille O'Neal, likes to basically sit in the paint and wait for you to come towards him so he can basically block the shot left and right and make it where pretty much layups are off limit. So the only way for you to actually basically make it where you get those layups is for you to actually force him to come out of the paint by hitting the three-pointers which is technically what they ended up doing once they did that through the first three quarters Davis had no choice but to start going after guys like Olenek and Johnson and Horford and that allowed Thomas to basically take over in the fourth quarter with a couple of easy baskets to hold the Pelicans off for the most part until they made their run late in the fourth quarter but if you don't have um, anything basically um, going with the three-point shot, then this team is pretty much screwed because of the fact that other than Thomas, you really don't have anybody else. You know, every Bradley maybe, but uh, you don't have anybody else who is truly capable of having the dribbling skills to get to the rim and finish a play with body contact being made on them. And again, um, I'm okay um, if the shoots are open and if the best three-point shooters are shooting those trees and uh, those shooters are with this with the following order uh, Isaiah Thomas then Al Horford then Ivory Bradley then uh, Kelly Olenek uh, even Terry Rozier and Jonas Jarebko here and there tonight he shot it one of two for example uh, tonight when you, we are talking about uh, the three points attempts, Marcus Smart took seven threes and he hit five threes out of seven, 71.4%. This is unbelievable, amazing. I mean, okay, he replaced Ivory Bradley and he had to take many shots because we needed that from him because this is the job that is usually done by uh, Ivory Bradley. So, Marcus Smart tonight had uh, seven trees. I'm okay because this is a specific case when Ivory Bradley is out. Jay Crowder, two out of five, 33%. It is not bad, but I don't like Jay Crowder to, to take many trees. Alcor for one of four, not good, not uh, too bad. Uh, Isaiah Thomas, 3 out of 6 or 50%. And I don't mind him to taking trees. Yeah, and I want Kelly Olinik to take more trees, Danny. One on one. I want he's having more opportunities, open opportunities, and he's making decisions to drive. I want him to shoot more. 
and Gerald Green, two out of three tonight, which is 66.7%, and he is, uh, uh, he is, uh, uh, he is, uh, um, I mean, uh, the great three point, uh, uh, three, three, three point shooter. So, what do you think about the shooting selection this game, Danny? For three. Oh, it seems like we have a message being sent to us. I'm trying to see what's being said, but for who did you say? Uh, Okay, read the question. Read the question. Well, it's actually uh, a question being a message being sent to us in regards to our live stream. So I don't know if there's uh, some sort of uh, technical difficulties going on with the website. So uh, I'm checking it out now. But, but who did you say the shooting selection for which player? For Green? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I said that uh, shooting selection in this game uh, was was good. I like it. Seven trees for smart. Seven out of five open trees. Seven out of ten field goal. Isaiah Thomas seven out of fifteen field goals, forty-six percent. Uh, three of six for three, fifty percent. Kelly Olynyk one of one. Jeller Green two out of three trees. Uh, Jay Crowder two out of five. And I I think Al Horford took um, four trees. And I think that uh, his shooting selection was good because, like I said, I want the best shooters to take threes. And I think that Gerald Green is a solid three-point shooter. Not the best three-point shooter in the, in the uh, world, but he can score the threes even over the camp. And this is what is uh, important in uh, Gerald Green's uh, case. Uh, now, um, Marcus Smart took five threes. He's not a three, good three-point shooter, but he has to take it because, A, he's playing point guard and the people are guarding him under the screen all the time, and he must uh, drain the threes in order to create... Uh, um, in order uh, to uh, cre 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 create... Uh, in order to create uh, uh, the spacing, uh, uh, the great uh, spacing for our uh, guards. And uh, Danny, it looks like uh, we received the message inbox uh, in uh, Celtic Stock Radio page. Yeah, which, and, uh, uh, like I said, it's coming, yeah, it's coming from Quap, so I'm looking at uh, his uh, statement right now. So letting you know that uh, Quap... Quap is saying that it's good to to see us basically live on uh, the on the website, the UStream website. Uh, he says basically that uh, the game between the Raptors and the Celtics is going to be a big test for the Celtics. And actually, Igor, um, I have information that you might be interested in uh, hearing for anybody that's out there that uh, you mentioned the standings, Igor, and uh, what the game basically might be uh, leading to. The Toronto Raptors tonight blew a 19-point lead to the Chicago Bulls, so the Celtics are now just one and a half back. The Raptors will have to play James Harden and the Rockets on Sunday, which of course is tomorrow, so if they lose that game, the Celtics will only be one back going into that game, so technically, the Celtics could end up tied with the Raptors if they beat the Raptors on Tuesday. Since December 16th, the Celtics have the best record, or tied, should I say, for the best record, with the Houston Rockets at 10-2 and in the NBA. So right now, that's really saying something. So the Raptors, if they lose tomorrow, the Celtics will be playing basically to be tied for number two in the East on Tuesday night. So look at that, Celtic fans. I said for you guys not to basically bail on this team just a couple weeks ago when everybody was ready to start saying, let's get rid of Al Horford. And they think about it. Tuesday, they could be playing for the number two spot. Uh, and again, uh, thanks for uh, watching us and for asking excellent questions. Our great um, uh, friend uh, Quap from uh, RedZarmy.com and uh, we are very glad uh, and happy. Uh, I hope that you can see us and that the stream is working. It should not be the problem. 
uh, in the streaming. Anyway, uh, Danny made the great point and the club uh, made uh, the uh, great point uh, because um, uh, if uh, we are one and half games uh, away from Toronto, I didn't have that result, uh, Toronto Bulls, and thanks club again. And I can say it that, uh, 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 in my opinion, James Harden and uh, 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 Houston Rockets are favorites. And I hope that they will do us the favor. I hope that uh, Harden will give uh, his A game. And I hope that um, in this game, Toronto Raptors will enter the game under the pressure. And um, uh, keep in mind... Uh, club and all the Celtics fans that the last game, Danny, if I'm correct, when we lost from Toronto Raptors, we didn't have uh, um, Jay Crowder and Isaiah Thomas. And we lost in TV Garden uh, pretty easily because um, they made uh, the run in the third quarter. If I'm correct, the, the Rosen followed in the fourth and um, uh, we were not able to stop them. Uh, but uh, we didn't play with the full squad. And if I'm correct, they played without Demare Carroll that game and without uh, Jared Salinger and probably one more guy, guy I cannot remember, but I think that the others were all, uh, the other uh, players were all available for the Raptors. They played without Crowder, I mean Salinger and Demare Carroll who uh, was injured then. Um, but uh, I'm hoping to see the full squads in um, Toronto. And yes, what this will be probably uh, the biggest test of the Celtics, uh, among, uh, besides those top five, top six teams that we were uh, playing with. And this will be the most important uh, game of the Celtics season thus far. And I, I, I definitely think if uh, Isaiah Thomas uh, and uh, Al Horford, uh, if I, I hope that Ivory Bradley will be available at that game. If we don't have Ivory Bradley uh, or somebody else like Tyler Zeller, I want the full squad, even Tyler Zeller, I want Ivory Bradley because we would need every single guy from the bench in order to defeat Toronto. And if the Zeller and uh, Bradley and all the other guys are ready. Uh, uh, and if Toronto loses that game in uh, Houston, they will be under the pressure to win the game against us. And I think that we can uh, defeat them. Uh, what do you think, then? Well, for, for, me, t for me, technically... Uh, we've been close both the, the one time we played them earlier this year as you said uh, it came down to the final few minutes pretty much the final um, final quarter Larry and DeRozan as usual basically did their thing and I pretty much uh, said when it came to that game you gotta basically choose to make uh, one of those guys beat you if not if you're gonna let both of them beat you you gotta shut down everybody else now, the good thing is that the Celtics are expected to have Avery Bradley back for that game after he missed tonight's game against the Pelicans, and we know that that's a must because you're going to need somebody other than Marcus Smart to be there in order to help shut down DeRozan and Lowry, at least give those guys some sort of a test because after Marcus Smart, the only other player you have really from the guard position that has a defensive mentality is Terry Rozier. Um, but... This Celtics team, everybody's going to have to basically, this is a game where you put up or shut up. You know, Jay Crowder in particular, after having that monster game against the Utah Jazz because he got pissed with the fans, basically cheering Gordon Hayward before the game. And he said that, that he took it as a sign of disrespect from the Celtic fans for them cheering a, a player from another team. This is something that basically, uh, this is a game where Crowder, since that game against Utah, hasn't done, hasn't really done much for the team. He uh, barely scored anything the other night, and he really didn't do nothing tonight against the Pelicans. So now this is a big game. This is where you put up or shut up, Crowder. The fans on Twitter were t basically telling him, if you basically can't take it, get out of Boston. You know, the fans are desperate right now for a star player. Gordon Hayward is a player that you know he brings his A game on every 
game that the Utah Jazz plays right now. That's yeah. one thing people va- the the fans will value Gordon Hayward over Crowder for, which is that Hayward will come even if he doesn't have the best shooting night. He's gonna get you double figures each and every game. Crowder will come and give you zero points. If I'm correct, the game against um the 76ers, he actually scored nothing in that game. Amir Johnson outscored him. That is something that we can be saying is not supposed to happen. If you're Crowder and you want to basically say to the fans that you want your respect from them and that you ain't got no problem leaving Boston, well, brother, you got to do it on the court. You got to earn your respect on the court. And this is the best game to do it. Do it against one of the teams that's ahead of us in the league. Don't do it against a team that comes from the Western Conference that basically this team should beat you know, on each and every night of the week and two times on Sunday. Uh, yeah, and uh, Danny Ainge uh, said it. Um, uh, Brad Stevens said that uh, Jay Crowder went uh, over emotional. Um, and uh, 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 Danny Ainge said that uh, Marcus Mark sh- should use uh, those uh, shams from uh, the fans uh, as, as a fuel you know, to play better, and uh, I totally supported, uh, I totally support uh, what uh, Ainge uh, said. It was minor incidents any, anyway. I, w- I want to say one more statistic, uh, Danny. Um, uh, Isaiah Thomas in two games without Ivory Bradley this season, 19 points and zero assists. But both times, Marcus Smart started in Ivory Bradley's place and played a lot of point guard with Isaiah taking the shooting guard's role. And uh, this is probably why Isaiah Thomas didn't have the assists. The other night uh, against the Jazz, he had, uh, you know, um, he had like uh, uh, 15 assists and 29 points. So it's not like uh, uh, Isaiah Thomas cannot assist, but he played shooting guard and in this game, uh, the smart was... uh, uh, the point guard, and uh, that, that is why, uh, without uh, uh, Ivory Bradley, Isaiah Thomas had uh, 19, 90 points. And when we talk about the smart tonight, uh, uh, 22 points, five rebounds, six assists, uh, five of seven for three, um, and two steals, and five of seven for three again. And I love this smart. And Isaiah Thomas is now 28 points per game. Uh, fourth in the NBA uh, in uh, points per game. So, what do you think about those two informations, uh, Daniel? Isaiah Thomas without ever did 90 points, and Marcus Smart started uh, as a point guard in the in the place of Ivory Bradley, but played point guard. And Isaiah Thomas with Marcus Smart played shooting guard with Ivory Bradley. Isaiah Thomas is playing point guard because Ivory Bradley is off ball guard. And Marcus Smart loves, uh, obviously, to play with Isaiah Thomas. So, and he scored 22 points, 5 rebounds, 6 assists, 2 steals, 1 monster game. And he's a good role player. And um, somebody says, I think Thomas King at the Twitter, that uh, Marcus Smart needs only to have that outside shooting better uh, just to become Robert Horry type of role player. And I think that... He's totally right. What do you think then? Well, Marcus Smart basically has proven throughout his career that he's capable of having some big games and even starting on, you know, a team starting lineup. This this season, he's basically, uh, in my opinion, he's over exceeded the, the expectations knowing all the injuries that have basically taken place he has stepped up his game big time to the next level to actually make sure that this team is in the position it's in in a game like tonight pretty much uh, as you mentioned he was the point guard and that's because technically him and Isaiah Thomas and you could say uh, Terry Rozier those three guys are the point guards for this team but of course, you gotta have Isaiah Thomas on the floor to start the game because he's the superstar, the main man for this team. So if Avery Bradley out, you moving Isaiah Thomas to the shooting guard position and letting Marcus Smart start makes it where Isaiah Thomas will get more time off the ball handling and can actually run around and try to work to get himself more open for shooting the ball. If when Avery Bradley's on the court, the ball is in 
in Isaiah Thomas's hands 90% of the time. He's always got guys double teaming him, forcing him to try and make, you know, backwards passes, passes between two guys to try and basically force somebody else to beat them. In this case, Marcus Smart, you know, is smart enough where he knows how to find the open man. He proved that tonight with several of his plays, finding guys like Amir Johnson, finding the mismatches that will go in the Celtics' favor. And, you know, it works. Avery Bradley, he's not someone that has those type of dribbling skills and the, the skills when it comes to making the passes, which is why he's the shooting guard. He's more of a Ray Allen type player, except that, you know, Ray Allen didn't have any defensive, you know, talent. Avery Bradley does. So Marcus Smart has really basically proven that he's capable of starting at the point guard position which is where technically, if you were to go the position of, let's say, having to trade away Avery Bradley for whatever reason, let's say things don't work out between you and him, he he, he wants more money and he's not willing to sign, re-sign with this team at some point in the future, you still have Marcus Smart and Isaiah Thomas here, you could let Avery Bradley go because Smart basically could then jump into the starting lineup and you could live with the results because he's proving it now that him and Thomas can basically get the job done together just like Avery Bradley and Thomas can get the job done together. Uh, and Stevenson Smart, I know uh, what he does to help you win. Uh, he could not score a point uh, and he will still be positive impact on uh, winning and uh, statistics are proving uh, uh, his points. Brett Stevens points, Marcus Smart, uh, plus minus factor, plus 18. Uh, 22 points tonight, uh, uh, 7 of 10 field goals, 70%. In 26 minutes, 37 seconds as a starter, starter, including 5 of 7 for 3, 71.4%, 3 of 3 uh, for 1, and uh, 4 rebounds, um, 5 assists, 2 steals, and plus minus plus 18. Kudos to Marcus Smart, replaced Ivory Bradley excellently, and this was, uh, he was actually, uh, Danny, the player of the game, if I'm correct, uh, yeah, uh, the 22 MVP. Uh, yeah, uh, he was the MVP. And before go goes to before goes to uh, game recap, just one information. Remember, Ante Zizic, that we talked about at at the last show that he went to Darusha Fakadogos, right? And remember, guys that are listening us, that we said that he had one shy game against, um, in the first round, against Barcelona, that uh, his team lost. Now, his team lost against Maccabi 93-92, uh, and uh, that guy, Ante Zizic, played 24 minutes, and he had monster game, um, 14 points, 9 rebounds, 6 out of 8 for 2, and uh, nine rebounds and uh, 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 three fouls on him, index uh, or, or PER, uh, players estimated rating 21. So Ante Zizic already is proving himself in EuroLeague, which is the second best league uh, besides NBA practically in the, on the world. So we can only be happy and excited to watch this guy. Uh, hopefully, the next season and the season and the years beyond blossoming in our jersey. So don't worry, Boston Celtics fans, because we have young, talented, and upcoming center, which will be the monster when he gets stronger. Thoughts about that, Danny? Well, again, you know, when it comes to those players playing in those other leagues, we've seen many of them come in and flourish in the NBA. We've seen others come and be complete bust. You know, the kid basically has to be given a shot at some point. And uh, if it's the Celtics that do it, I ain't got no problem with it. Um, but the fact that he's basically doing that well should mean that somebody in the NBA at some point should be giving that, that kid a try, knowing basically that he's, you know, showing that he's better than a majority of the players in the league that he's currently in, 
which could mean that basically that uh, he should do pretty well than several of the players we got right now in the NBA as it is. So it, it's unfortunate that a lot of those guys out there basically do so well, but then never get the opportunity to come to the NBA and make the type of money that the players we have today make. Yet you got guys that come to this league and can make close to a million dollars just to sit on the bench and do nothing, you know, each and every season. You know, why not give somebody who basically does have talent the right to basically come and do the same thing? Why give it to somebody else just because they are somebody who came out of college here when you can give it to somebody from another country who might actually be able to help you? And when we talk about uh, the trees, Danny, uh, two more informations. Heliolinic about the trees. Trees are more, more contagious than the flu, which is pretty contagious, said Heliolinic. And uh, Jay King, our friend, the report said only two teams have more made threes per game than, than the Celtics now. The Rockets and Cavaliers. Warriors are behind the Celtics in the fourth place. I will repeat. The Celtics are number three in made threes this season, which, was, which is very important to far because we play motion offense which is creating open space and open shooting opportunities for our guys. And it is important that the Celtics keep on scoring um, threes and making them, which is the most important. So in May threes, we are number three behind Cavaliers and Rockets. Warriors behind us, believe it or not, right now, in this very moment. In May three-pointers. Al Horford makes the game easy for everybody and makes magnificent passes as, as the center and deep, deep playmaking center to tell, to, to tell this way. And Al Horford creates a lot of open uh, shooting opportunities for, for his teammates. And he is not, he is a not selfish player and he has been the great addition to this ball club. And uh, the shooting selection is better, and some players raised three-point field goal uh, made percentage, and this is the reason of these statistics. Your comment about that, Danny? Uh, yeah, and to add on your story, uh, even uh, LeBron James called Isaiah Thomas superstar after Cavaliers game and praised him practically, and uh, this supports your story. And we certainly hope that at least Isaiah Thomas uh, is not out for two, but uh, uh, you, 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 you know uh, that uh, uh, it is harder for Horford to enter. MVP, I mean all-star game, but we will see. Uh, Thomas King, again, the great with 
people think I'm going crazy, but I'm saying Kelly Olinik is fantastic defender. I must say that um, uh, I will uh, search for uh, statistics, uh, uh, Daniel um, defensive ratings, uh, uh, but the players adv advance right away coming and. Um, but I must say that uh, uh, he's not. He uh, he didn't make mistakes, uh, Daniel, uh, because you know uh, that uh, Ken Olinik improved uh, his. Uh, defensive skills, uh, of course, uh, he's struggling and when the opponent's centers are stronger than him. And you can see Joel Embiid or Anthony Davis scoring over him, posting him up, but against majority of the centers, that is another story. The story that the Celtics need a legit backup center and they are struggling against uh, the teams with the mess and with the size down low. But that is the Celtics' problem the whole year. That is not just Kelly Olinik's problems. And his problem is because he is not uh, the good rebounder. He is not as good rebounder as he should be, as the seven footer center, you know? But uh, he definitely improved um, his um, uh, definitely improved his defense, and I can support that uh, by uh, finding his uh, statistics, uh, advanced statistics, and here it is. Uh, offensive rating is one hundred three point three, one hundred three point four, and defensive rating is one hundred two point eight, which means. That the net rating, which is practically the difference between the offensive and defensive rating, is positive. Plus 0.5 points per 100 possession with Kelly Olenek on, on, the, on the court. And uh, assist his assist, uh, assist uh, percentage, 15.4, is excellent for the center. Uh, his uh, assist to turnover ratio is, is good too. 1.69. Uh, I mentioned that uh, rebounding percent is not uh, uh, the best. Uh, he is grabbing 11.1 percent of the available rebounds. But uh, uh, you know, and my my objection to him is that he can shoot better. But I definitely think that he uh, improved uh, his defense. And another statistics for Sean Grundy, uh, Boston Celtics making 17 threes in a game. The first 3.02 games, 37.4 uh, seasons, three. These four games, nine day, day stand, four. I will, I will repeat, the Boston Celtics making 17 threes in the game. The first 3,028 games, 37.4 seasons, only three times. And these four games, nine days, home stand, four times 17 or more trees. So isn't that impressive, Danny? And comment on Linux and his defense. That right there just shows you, you know... <laughs> That's that's almost historic. The fact that you can actually say that not only are you talking about the fact that it's you're talking big three era with Bird, Parrish, and the rest of those guys from the '80s. You're talking about the KG, Pierce, Ray Allen era. None of those teams ever basically did what this team in the last four last four games basically has done. You know, this Celtics team is basically making history left and right as of late. Isaiah Thomas, you know, put his name in the record books a couple of days ago with that 52-point performance. Then he did it again with the, with the assist, you know, performance he had. 
So this, you know, it's truly becoming a, a historic uh, situation for the Celtics team. You know, the only thing that will cap it off would basically be a championship at the end of the season. If that was to happen, then forget it. You know, this team would have the ultimate bragging rights with everything they're doing. But when it comes to Kelly Olynyk, you mentioned the rebounding, and I've brought that up in one of the la- one of the latest shows. We've seen it with Kelly Olynyk, his rebounding issue. In my opinion, it's all an effort situation. Kelly Olynyk yeah. doesn't put enough effort to go after the ball. We've seen the ball bounce off the rim, go right over him, and he'll just stand there and watch the ball go. And instead of running after it, you know, yeah, even if you collide with a player and they call you for the foul, fine, I'll live with it. But to just stand there and let the ball go and hit the ground and let somebody else pick pick it up rather than actually going after it, that ball gets picked up by a player from the other team. That's, you know, you giving them another shot just because you decided to sit there and be lazy. You know, this is something that we're seeing, you know, guys like Amir Johnson as of late has basically been out hustling this guy and putting up, you know, a better performance because he's been diving for balls, yeah. fighting yeah. with um, amongst two and three other players for the rebounds. Yeah. Kelly Olenek, the only thing as of late that he's really been getting the, you know, doing basically to try and prove that he belongs on the floor is the fact that he's more consistent on the offensive f- um, floor than Amir Johnson is. But the Celtics starting lineup has found a way to get Amir Johnson more involved because they've been sacrificing their own shots, you know, Thomas, Bradley, Crowder, Horford, to get Amir Johnson the easy shots down low because they've been getting him into the mismatch positions. And so Amir Johnson has been getting into the double figures as of late. But Kelly Olenek, if you're not going to actually get the job done defensively and getting the job done at least rebounding, then you got to make sure you get the job done when it comes to the scoring. Because if that's not the case, you got Jordan Mickey and you got Tyler Zeller, two other guys who are capable of basically doing the same thing you're doing when it comes to the rebounding situation. But those guys will put the effort to actually run. And unlike Olenek, both those guys are capable of blocking the shots. So let those two guys basically jump in there and take Olenek's minutes if he's not going to go the route of at least scoring the ball when he knows he's not going to basically put the effort in on the defensive end. Um, and about uh, uh, the, re- I, I must say definitely that uh, the defense again, the defense of Kelly Olynyk is better this season. But unfortunately, I think that the offense is not there. Uh, he's not taking uh, as many shoots, uh, three pointers as he should, in my opinion. And second thing is uh, <clears throat> that uh, second thing is uh, that uh, uh, I mean. Uh, he is having open opportunities, so I hope that uh, he will raise three-point shooting uh, in the uh, remaining of uh, the season, in the second half of uh, uh, the uh, season. Uh, now, uh, Danny, about uh, what you have been talking about, the um, rebounding. I agree that it's it's about the effort on the court, <clears throat> and I must praise Mr. Amir Johnson for the effort, hustling, and Tommy Kenson uh, praised him, uh, saying that, um, you know, um, he is doing the little things to make uh, the Celtics win the games, and, uh, you know, um, he is hustling, rebounding. The other night against Philadelphia 76ers, he had the clutch rebound in the last two minutes, minutes, and um, like you said, he is out hustling uh, Kelly Olinik. And he start he's starting to deserve his starting spot. And um, I must say that uh, uh, that rebounding issue, we talk on one of, of the shows, I think with Rich Jensen from RedsArmy.com. I think that um, it is uh, part, part, uh, one part of the problem is what you said, that is uh, uh, the effort and the mindset, you know. Um, and by the way, the second thing is, I think, uh, our strategy or, you know, uh, I think that Brad Stevens is abandoning offensive rebounds 
in order to get back in the transition. I think that we are kind of back to Doc Rivers' strategy. Denny, if you remember, Doc Rivers put emphasis into transitional defense over offensive rebounding. And I think that this is the case what Brad Stevens is doing. But on the other side, we are not able to clean the defensive glass. And this is a systematic problem. Uh, I think that Danny Ainge should address until the trade de deadline to this problem. And that is by bringing backup center, good rebounder five or four, such as Andrew Bogot, who will certainly leave um, Mavericks. But this is for the next hour topics. And the third part is, like I said, the effort, the strategy, and systematic problem. And in my opinion, we should address to that problem by uh, bringing in another center in the trade trade deadline. If you want to, you know, uh, be uh, the force in the in the playoffs and potentially knock out Toronto Raptors. This is just my opinion. Anyway. Let's get to the game's breakup. Uh, tonight's game, Boston Celtics 117, um, 108 Pelicans. Uh, Anthony Davis 36 points, 15 rebounds, monster game. Two blocks, Livingston Galloway 20 points, 4 rebounds. Marcus Mark 22 points, 5 rebounds, 6 assists, 2 steals. Isaiah Thomas 38 points, 6 of 11 for 3. And three points, field goals, the Celtics 18. This is fourth straight game, 17 plus games. And Pelicans 10 threes. Points out of turnovers, the Celtics 21 and Pelicans 9. This is the key of the game. Uh, the threes, Celtics 18 and the Pelicans 10. This is the difference plus uh, 24. And points out of three turnovers, the Celtics 21, Pelicans 9, uh, this is the difference, plus 12. So, in three-pointers, we had plus 24 difference. In, in, in points out of turnovers, we had plus 12 difference, and those are two keys of the game. And when you look about uh, at the other statistics, Daniel, uh, such as... Uh, uh, largest lead 17 fast break points 10 points in the paint 28 bench points 21 the second chance points 20 so let's go one by one and co co compare uh, the two teams um the first statistic is i said the Celtics fast break points 10 and the pelicans fast break points 7 so the celtics plus 3 in the fast break points and we we know that the Celtics are leaving Danny in the uh, from the fast break points and from the points out of transition and this is important statistics points in the paint uh, 28 28 despite the monster performance of um, the Pelicans especially Davis uh, the points in the paint uh, paint paint uh, tied Bench points, uh, the Celtics 21 and um, Pelicans 20. The Celtics won bench uh, battle, plus one. And the statistics, second chance points, uh, 20. And second chance points, uh, New Orleans, uh, 12. So, uh, when, when, when you look at the rebounding, uh, the Celtics had... Let me see, 36 rebounds. And when you look at the rebounding uh, uh, department, uh, 27. So we out-rebounded uh, Pelicans, which is excellent. And second chance points, uh, we had uh, plus eight, uh, 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 a plus eight, uh, you know, advantage. So bench points plus one advantage, second chance points, plus 8 advantage for the Celtics, points out of turnovers, plus 12 advantage, 
points in the paint tied fast break points uh, plus three Celtics uh, from the three points line 18 3 Celtics 10 point 10 threes uh, Pelicans uh, the difference plus 24 so basically Danny in all categories the Celtics were better monster performance I mean MVP Marcus Smart 22 points uh, five assists and four rebounds, seven of ten shooting, including five of seven for three. Isaiah Thomas, 21, uh, 21 points. Am, uh, is this correct? Yeah, uh, uh, 20, 20, 21 points and uh, 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 three rebounds, uh, including three of six for three and seven of 15 field goal. Uh, then uh, 10 points from Gerald Green. Two of three for three, and other, other than that, Crowder eight and Al Horford eight points and seven rebounds and six assists, uh, flirting with a triple double, but not quite uh, there. And two uh, turnovers for Al Horford plus six. Uh, in plus minus, the leader is Smart plus eighteen. Then Jalen Brown plus no. Then Johnson plus fifteen. Yeah. Then uh, Crowder and Brown plus 10. So what is your take on uh, just statistics from the game then? Well, the fact that the Celtics thoroughly dominated uh, all those stats you mentioned was pretty impressive, especially after the slow start they got off to. Um, of course, when you look at the, the scoring, the thing that pretty much the Celtics can say, the, one of the main reasons they ended up winning was the fact that they won the rebounding battle. In particular, the offensive rebounding was one of the main reasons why they won tonight. We saw several possessions where the Celtics ended up getting uh, two or three, or should I say uh, about two offensive rebounds on one play, and it would lead to not only them chewing up you know, several seconds on the clock, but also coming away, instead of coming up with a missed layup, they come away with a three-pointer. Uh, one of the one of the best um, plays for that, for example, was, um, if I'm correct, it was Isaiah Thomas, who uh, missed the jumper. He got the, um, off, Al Horford got the offensive rebound. He kicked it out and ended up um, basically going, it ended up leading to um, Gerald Green basically getting a, a three-pointer at the end. Um, but getting two offensive rebounds on one possession, you're basically making the other team have to play nearly a minute's worth of, of, of defense in that, that case. And you end up, you know, not only draining them, but you also make it where, you know, spiritually, you know, they're thinking that we just played some good defense and at the last second they end up getting a three-pointer. Gerald Green, you know, you mentioned Marcus Smart being the MVP, but I actually also feel Gerald Green deserves to get some credit here tonight as Gerald Green came away with uh, 15 points tonight in that game. In 16 minutes, he went 3 of 7 from the floor, 2 of 3 from downtown, and 7 of 7 from the free throw line. But what makes those points so um, so important was the time they came in. Those points, a majority of them came in at the time where the Celtics were making their run to take the lead from the Pelicans. And once they got past the Pelicans, they never gave the lead back. So Gerald Green played a key role because of the fact that he was out there, he managed to help the Celtics basically pass the Pelicans. And uh, if I'm correct, it was um, him, Smart, uh, um, Kelly Olenek, uh, Terry Rozier, and uh, I believe it was Crowder on the floor at that time, or Jalen Brown. But um, Gerald Green has really basically made a statement ever since Brad Stevens opted to give him the right to come back onto the court and get some minutes. You know, Terry Rozier has been the one that's kind of lost out as of late. But, you know, if Avery Bradley not playing tonight, Terry Rozier got to play 13 minutes at least and got four points. One of the big plays, of course, was the ta the putback he got, he had when he uh, tapped in Al Horford's missed jump jumper and he had a... Uh, two Pelicans on him at that time. Um, but you got to admit, the fact that the Celtics won this game with all those stats stats being won in their favor, that right there, regardless of basically the point situation, you got to give that the team credit. You know, they started off slow, and at the same time you can say if Avery Bradley would have been playing tonight, 
you probably would have won by more, especially knowing that you dominated those stats. So this truly was a pretty impressive win, especially knowing that you lost to them last time, so you needed to basically make a statement by beating this team on your own floor, knowing that you're going up to Toronto, and that's going to be a tough game. Uh, yeah, I have addition to that uh, line about Kelly Olinik as defender, uh, Thomas King. People are thinking that I'm crazy for saying Kelly Olinik is fantastic defender. Kevin O'Connor from uh, uh, Comca Sportsnet and a uh, couple of other sites said that Kelly plays his ass off and he's almost uh, always in the right position. In pick and roll, he stays in front. And then near give a uh, better, uh, better uh, like uh, contests on pull up jumpers. Great smarts. Uh, this is about Kelly Linux uh, defense, uh, the short edition. And uh, right now, uh, Danny, uh, I mean, uh, let's uh, recap the game uh, short uh, right before we skip uh, to uh, the. I mean, uh, analyzing a little game before we skip to the other two games. Uh, I mean, and hurry up the process. Uh, Marcus Smart, uh, uh, MVP, and Zia Thomas, 38 points, lead the Boston Celtics in against New Orleans. Uh, the uh, silliness factor kicked in about the midway through the third. The that point, Marcus Smart had blazed like a forest fire. And the New Orleans uh, were outplayed in many other ways, but hadn't done anything totally out of the ordinary. Um, Marcus Smart has stood up to the Anthony Davis in the post, but Smart semi-regular fights out his weight plus there. He defended Davis in the law. He had drilled his first three triples, but Smart goes on runs like that from outside. He had physical, physically refused to let Buddy Hill drive in the paint, paint on several locations. But yeah, that's sort of just what Smart does. He um, does, doesn't typically make um, and one three pointers while falling down, but Smart uh, struck with uh, uh, forceful finesse Saturday night, uh, starting in place of injured Avery Bradley. On unusual, do everything but shoot. Smart did all his typically nasty work, but also get water from the trees and uh, shoot it seven of five trees, uh, 22 points, seven of 10 shooting, uh, and go six assists, five rebounds. He was phenomenal. So the Celtics was shooting phenom phenomenally, uh, phenomenal shooting for three after decimating another top 10 defense with 18 out of 36 shooting. Uh, so, this is top 10 defense, Danny. This is not just any other defense. And we out top the defense with 18 out of 36 shooting beyond the arc. And the Celtics now four straight games with 17 and more threes. That makes one of the NBA record. Uh, the Houston Rockets set earlier in the season with 17 more threes in uh, three and more games. The... Isaiah Thomas scored typically, typically efficient 38 points, including 17 in the fourth, when he almost uh, always punishes anyone, uh, include unlucky enough to defend him. The Pelicans kind of threatened to come back, cutting their lead to 10, but Thomas somehow responded with a pair of threes, and remaining New Orleans fourth quarter ownership doesn't belong to them. The Celtics still didn't slam the door shut afterward, but he had plenty of cautions to survive anyway. Green, 15 points, and Kelly Olenek, 12. Both has nine games out of the bench. Al Horford contributed eight assists and seven rebounds, despite having a very tough game, uh, putting the ball through the basket. Al Horford, three of 18 shooting. It was rough shooting night for Al. But it was Smart who did almost yank the Celtics out of the early fun. They didn't uh, always look good, but uh, they stood stronger after a rough opening nine minutes. The fun. Four minutes into the first, Davis 
36 points and 15 rebounds. Yet or already scored eight points. And I ask, uh, and I mean, um, J King asked the reporter, uh, would he rather have Davis or MB? And reporter said, wow. Uh, and he said he would pick Davis because he seems like less of healthy risk. Davis is also damn forced, and he gave Amir Johnson plenty of problems down low. Jeru Holiday played like a monster too, and the Celtics fell behind by double digit in the first. Near the end of the first, a sort of all bench group with Smart, who started again, uh, in front of Ivory Bradley, brought the Celtics back. Uh, Terry Rozier did something cool. Taylor Linux scored and passed, and Smart did a whole lot of both ends on the court. Even when Rondo away a fast break layup, um, the deci that decision didn't hurt the Celtics. Smart finished an, uh, 2 plus 1 later after that possession. The rest of the first half went kind of like this. The Davis showed his awesomeness in variety of fashions. Jalen Brown forced too many drives during one of the worst stretches of his young career. Green put forth another random outburst of produ productivity. The smart military pressed the Celtics back into lead, and technically speaking, Al Horford gave the Celtics their first lead in the game late in the second quarter when he hit the three-pointer his first made field goals of the night after seven straight misses. But the smart just did so much. He stole the ball away from Davis and went coast to coast for the layup. He spent a large chunk of the possessions refusing to let Buddy Hill drive past him, uh, then switched onto Davis to finish the same possession away this way. And he hits away five shots, including a trio of... Uh, Three pointers uh, while uh, adding four first half assists. Smart's only first half miss came on the end of the shot clock, heavy minutes before the halftime. He has an addiction for impossible heavies, but uh, he also has uh, a proactively for winning plays. The first half brought to mind what Thomas said about his teammate Friday. If you want to win, you need somebody like Smart, his definition of what the Celtics basketball is about. The Pelicans haven't played like a bad team lately. They have climbed into the top 10 of defenses since Jeru Holiday returned, and they now look like a possible playoff team in the West. The Celtics dispatched them with more than dynamic, di dynamic outside shooting to continue what has been welcome trend. And, I, I mean, the Pelican defense were surging early Saturday night, but the Boston stepped up to deliver a storm. The keys, everything seems to be falling Anthony Davis' way during the early going on Saturday night against Boston Celtics. He was dropping a flurry of shots during the opening night with the 3.42 mark in the second. The New Orleans Davis uh, sunk a driving contested baseline floater took unfortunate bounce out the rim for his 18 and 19 points of the night. He and Pelican's offense were controlling the pace at the moment and leading 51-47. Their luck uh, would fizzle out after that point. The Boston's defense awoke and did uh, not allow the, the Orleans to score a single field goal point for the remainder of the half. The Celtics' staunch defense carried over the third as the Pelicans made just one bucket during the opening four minutes on the uh, third. Meanwhile, the Boston's offense went on the nice run. Four for Thomas Mark led 10 one point run during the closing minutes of the first half and took a four points lead in the break. The spark from 10 one run continued in the third. The Celtics broke open game on route 170-108. Win. Boston outscored New Orleans 36-20 during the third quarter 
and Kel Davis to just five points with smart great defense. By the start of four, the Celtics had 93-73 advantage and the game was practically over and they never trailed from there. Danny, uh, something more to add on that game or we should move to Sixers? Well, I would just say that uh, this is the second game in a row that Brad Stevens uh, has allowed this team to start off slow. You know, they did it against Philadelphia and had to come back against them, and that was even more embarrassing than this than coming back. You know, starting slow and having to come back against this Pelicans team. At least they didn't wait. You know, as long as they did um, in the game against Philly, which we'll be talking about, I guess now. But uh, yep. Brad Stevens has to has to do something to give this team a nice kick in the behind to jumpstart them at the start of these games, because if you do that against some of the better teams in the league, they ain't no guarantee you're going to get back into the game, especially a game like Tuesday nights against the Raptors. You start slow against them, you, they could basically pull away too too much in that very first um very first few minutes that you may not be able to come back when it matters most. Uh, okay, uh, let's uh, uh, let's now uh, turn uh, our attention into the win against uh, the uh, Philly, 110, 106. Al Horford's late three-pointer pushes both the Celtics past Philadelphia 76ers, 110, 106. Al Horford in the right corner with a triple, uh, clutch time. After Messi first half and an even fourth quarter, the Boston Celtics needed the fourth time all star big man to drill a go ahead three pointer with 17.2 seconds left on the clock to hold off the Philadelphia 76ers 110-106. The play began begun with an Isaiah Thomas hitting Kelly Olinik on the pick and roll. Uh, Olinik drew for the defender to help and pinch the ball to the corner. Um, and B tried to rotate, but uh, he was late. And uh, Al Horford caught and B one lesson and scored important triple for the uh, win, practically. Uh, Hugh, Celtics head coach Brad Stevens, might have taught himself on the bench. The Celtics committed too many turnovers, let the Sixers kill them in the paint earlier, and surrendered the late lead. But Horford, 19 points. 12 rebounds, 4 assists, drained a big three. Ersan Ilyasova, the Turkey player, 20 points, was great the whole night, but he missed go ahead jumper after mad scramble at the other end. And Amir Johnson made one of two free throws after he had clutch rebounds, and Ilyasova had another chance to give his team a lead, but Porford forced air ball with a strong contest on the three points attempt. Uh, Ivory Bradley and Jalen Brown went to the pregame warm-ups Friday night and the Celtics assistants uh, look across the court at the 76ers. They have taken bullets of criticism of the past few years for one of the most obvious rebuilding process in the NBA history, but have finally started to show the outline of competitive team. The uh, quality record hasn't come yet, but they um, entered Friday night with two straight wins, and the Celtics coaches didn't want to overlook them. They are getting pretty good. The Celtics players didn't aim to prove him right, surely, but spent the latter four portion of three quarters doing opposite. They played an inspired first half and convinced, convinced uh, Stevens to call timeout just 47 seconds into the third, but found place, ways to pull themselves in, out of the predicaments. Uh, when the Celtics ra- run finally uh, came later in the third, it felt more surprisingly that inevitable. It came a uh, known list with Bradley, Bradley pumping in buckets and his teammates sliding their feet to final manufacture stops. Bradley tapped backdoor for dunk, then un- unleashed uh, uh, Deadly crossover to free himself for three pointer. It probably wasn't high percentage shoot, but he had already hit five threes by then and probably figured why not. 
Kelly Olenik chased down Robert Covington to force transitional miss. And we were talking about Kelly Olenik improved defense. Then slide, slid, uh, slide his feet to take a charge on Joel Embiid. Again, good defense. The big man's fifth foul. And later, Joel Embiid would receive sixth foul. Olenik doesn't always receive proper credit for his defense, but left his mark at the end while the Celtics with Thomas and Falford on the bench elite double digit deficit. Uh, we should al also notice that Terry Rozier full court pressure which took 76ers out of their offense during the critical late third quarter stretch. The second year pro hasn't been a part of Stevens rotation lately but Rozier lifted his team when he has given the opportunity. And the Celtics weren't um, perfectly in the fourth. Uh, Norlis Noel flew into the sky for a couple of tanks, and Thomas failed to take over like he normally does. Uh, the lefty, who finished 24 points and 6 of 14 shooting, but committed season-high 7 turnovers, did hit a 3-pointer, with late more than two minutes to push his team to lead, 103, 199. And B unleashed a dunk of three guards to cut the margin to the two. And the Sixers had opportunity to take over, but we described those possessions of person Ilyasova. Celtics delivered just enough plays down the stretch. And B's first half against the Celtics bad one. Initial thoughts after seeing Embiid is, wow, that dude is not normal. Please, please, please let him stay healthy. But if he does, the 76ers could be Eastern Conference force in the few years. During his franchise player, no doubt. During his first shift, Embiid slammed home a powerful dunk, bulldozed Amir Johnson in the post, but missed a layup. Bank a three-pointer and added another back. He later decimated a double team by finding Noel all alone under the foot, stepping straight through Horford's intended post defense for bucket of his own and roll to the foot for pick and roll jam. Though he looked like um, the rookie in the second half, and B still does, does things hardly any man can accomplish. Uh, not so impressive first half for the Celtics, who had we're opening two quarters in a lot of ways. For the first time in about months, Thomas played flawed half. Apparently, he's capable of being less than surreal in the offense. The lefty committed five turnovers and matching his season high seven minutes in the second quarter. Uh, I've really drilled a bundle of three pointers um, early with some of his teammates followed suit but the Celtics couldn't manage any sort of consist offense in the arc. Al Horford, though, uh, thought he had open layup, but Noyles made a recovery to slap it away. Thomas tried to draw foul on Embiid, but Embiid slid his feet well enough to defend with illegal contact. Bradley put his team on the top early with the neck of the shoot making his play, but missed a number of up fakes dribble pull-ups later in the half. And this was mismatched early, just not in the direction most people expect. The Celtics uh, have uh, stampeded really against some of the top de defenses of NBA, but failed to put enough force against the Sixers' length, athleticism and tend tendency. Uh, uh, tensity. Uh, if only one statistic could be shared to describe the first half, it could be points in the paint. In the first half, the Sixers scored for 30 and 6 for the Celtics. And the frequency revealed a lot about the two defenses. We just saw about three a lot of times. Early, Gerald Henderson did plenty of scoring. Boston might, might have not been blown out before halftime if they hit, um, didn't hit 18 triples, including smart end of the shot clock carry. Uh, they ended up 19 threes, Franchise record on 42 attempts. 
19 out of 42 trees on she's record. And they uh, did that with Jay Crowder boring points corners. Four for Sneaky, he holds Noel with his left arm when he reach, reaches his back at the second, last second. Then runs points for assist. Four for miss a six or seven shots, but nobody should call that for that. The man was a killer in the fort and the Celtics needed every of his buckets. And that's about my take, take from the 76ers game. Uh, so shoot yours uh, impressions from uh, the game, Danny, about uh, 76ers game. Well, again, I think the Celtics kind of underestimated the Celt- the 76ers team going into it. Um, that's why I feel that they weren't prepared. The 76ers had won two in a row, if I was, if I'm correct, going into that game, which is why you know there was no excuse, you, you know, for the Celtics, basically to underestimate this Sixers team going into the game. But the fact that they actually started off that slow. As I mentioned just a little while ago, they're lucky it's the 76ers because let that be against any of the good teams and they would have really been in some serious trouble. You know, but because it's the 76ers, one of the worst teams in the NBA, you're able to come back. Uh, the you know you just the report just mentioned you know Jay Crowder and saying that nobody should hold it against him you know the fact that he went scoreless in 30 minutes you know in my in my opinion you know I know you I know the person wants to go the route of basically trying to sweeten it but come on you know Jay Crowder wants to talk a big game and act like he deserves respect as I said earlier on the, here on our broadcast but then yet that's the type of performance you're basically going to give us. Why after one game where basically, you know, you go the route of going off because you felt disrespected by the Celtic fans, you're going to come and score score nothing against the worst team in the NBA and make it where your team basically had to have some big-time buckets down the stretch in order to actually beat one of the worst teams. You know, that's where technically people will look at you and say, you don't basically, yeah, we respect you, but you don't, you haven't earned the respect of basically being treated like you're untouchable or untradeable, like someone like Al Horford or Isaiah Thomas might be treated by some of the fans right now, or even Avery Bradley, because of performances like that. We know one game, you'll show up. The next game, you could be all the way on the other side of the country, basically, when it comes to your mind. Your body is there, but your mind isn't, you know, when it comes to your offensive performance. You know, even Danny Ainge, I don't know if you've heard this, Igor, he was actually joking on the radio that Celtic fans should disrespect uh, Jay Crowder more often. Because maybe that'll piss him off more often so he can put up a better performance more often. You know, when you have your general manager actually saying something like that, that right there is a bad sign. You know, and for Jay Crowder, basically, you're making, you know, a a pretty decent amount of money, basically, to play. And you're starting. You know, right now, you make, luckily for you, Amir Johnson basically put up 13 points in this game. So, basically, he did your job for you that night. If Amir Johnson would have had a usual game where he's not putting up much, the Celtics could have very well ended up losing this game. So Jay Crowder has to consider himself lucky. So there's no way that anybody should be giving Jay Crowder a pass for basically putting up no points in a game against one of the worst teams in the NBA, especially in third minutes. If you would have told me that he had foul trouble and couldn't play many minutes or if he got injured and had to leave the game early, fine. But 30 minutes, that's unexcusable to score nothing in 30 minutes, you know. After that, you know, Marcus Smart, this was another game where he came up big. He was the only one off the bench that really did anything. 14 points, so you could say if it hadn't been for him and Amir Johnson basically putting up their performances, you know, we probably would have lost because Horford, Thomas, and Bradley, those are the three guys that you expect to show up each and every game. After that, it's a question mark of who else will show up and give those guys a hand. And in this game, it was Smart and Johnson. So, you know, those guys basically were the ones that saved the game with their performances, you know. But the fact that we actually nearly lost this game to one of the worst teams in the NBA, and like you said, we were down by double figures 
is especially on our own court. If we would have been in Philadelphia, okay, maybe you could say it's you know a road game, you know, fine. But you're on, you're in the TD Garden. You're on the you know the the Celtics court, and you're letting one of the worst teams in the NBA do that to you, basically on your home floor. That to me is just embarrassing. Uh, yeah, and um, like I mean, like I said in the report, uh, Philadelphia 76ers, uh, Danny just exposed our weaknesses down low. They have, uh, el- I mean, athletic. I'm not defending anybody, but just saying that they have indeed, they have Okafor, they have Dario Saric, who is excellent young player. Uh, they have Erson Ilyasova. They have uh, Okafor, J.K. Okafor, Norlis Noel, bunch of young players. I'm, what I'm saying, we will have problems, Danny, with those kind of teams, with athleticism, size, mass down low, the bigs that can block shoots, that can run the transition, that can score the trees, like Philadelphia is having. It is just the systematic issues. You know, it is not a surprise. And that is what I, I, I have been saying to you earlier that uh, Daniel should address that issue into uh, the trade, before the trade deadline. Because we want to enter the playoffs and the race with uh, Atlanta Cavaliers. Atlanta is having quite power and Paul Millsap still and you know cavaliers have centers and they are bringing more players and toronto is having also their centers they they they, they will have salinger back and i really think like i said i don't want to repeat myself that we need the backup center and i really hope that denny ames will address to that issue um until the end of the trade trade deadline, and that is uh, that is uh, February twentieth, uh, if I'm correct. Now, um, Danny, if you agree, let's go to the last game before we talk a little about the uh, you know uh, the trades, and this is this is uh, the Utah Jazz game. I mean, the last game that we are going to recap uh you 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 you, you know uh to tonight uh, because i talked uh, i mean first let 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 me uh hear you about uh, utah jazz game and those famous uh, chants <laughs> that uh, that you know um uh, Gordon Haver received come to Boston. Yeah, so of course, uh, many f- f- Celtic fans know about Gordon Hayward's connection to Celtics coach Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens uh, coached him in college, and Brad, uh, Gordon Hayward is a player that we've been linked to when it comes to the trade discussions. And Celtic fans, have, as I've mentioned, would like to see Gordon Hayward come this way. Prior to the game, from what was reported, Celtic fans actually cheered Gordon Hayward as he came onto the court. So they were giving him a nice ovation as he was basically being introduced. Um, It didn't appear that he was being cheered throughout the game, so Celtic fans knew basically not to cheer for him whenever he made a basket or anything like that. But both were. Come, come to Boston, yeah, to Boston. basically trying to cheer him and show him some love, hoping that maybe Gordon Hayward might consider coming to Boston, whether it be through trade or free agency, because he's one of the best three-point shooters in the NBA. And the fact that we got Brad Stevens here, which is, a, again, one of his former coaches from college, that would also make it where he might be willing to come. And Jay Crowder took offense, basically, to the Celtic fans cheering for Gordon Hayward because he basically plays the same position as Gordon Hay- as Jay Crowder, meaning that if we were to trade for Gordon Hayward, odds are the man that's going to get dealt or will be the odd man out would be Jay Crowder. So Jay Crowder, after the game was over, 
basically explaining how he didn't like the Celtic fans cheering for Gordon Hayward and that he feels that we shouldn't be cheering for no players uh, from any other team, regardless of the circumstances. Um, and it took a couple of Celtic fans who went after Crowder for his, you know, him giving his opinion, telling him basically it's Boston. If you can't, if you don't like it, then leave. For example, and Crowder ended up saying that you know that I ain't got no problem leaving Boston, so that kind of led to a situation. Of course, now we have Igor back. That led to a situation with Brad Stevens having to talk to Gay Crowder the next morning, and having to basically try to get him to calm down. And Crowder admitted that he was uh, he made a mistake by going onto Twitter and letting his frustrations out, and he apologized to the Celtic fans for saying what he said, but that he still stands by what he by what he said, which is that he feels we shouldn't be chanting for fans from other teams. Meanwhile, when it for players from other teams, should I say? Meanwhile, when it comes to the game, you know, this was a game that pretty much, if it wasn't for Crowder, you know, as we mentioned, uh, Danny Ainge saying that we should offend him more often. Crowder took this game personally. He scored 21 points in 35 minutes, going six of eight from the floor, five of six from downtown, four of four from the free throw line. He added three rebounds, one assist, one steal, and had two fouls. He was a plus 21, which was the best plus negative uh, ratio on the team. You know, that's one of the best performances we've seen out of Crowder in quite some time. It's just unfortunate that it took him getting a, having to get offended from a, from basically something the fans did in order for him to actually put up a performance like that. So... Him basically doing that allowed the Celtics to basically get the job done. Amir Johnson, you know, scored six points. And in this game, it was actually Jalen Brown who was the best player off the bench as he scored 10 points in 13 minutes. But Jay Crowder basically was the difference in this game. Him coming up, he managed to help, as I said, the three guys who always you expect to always put up, Horford, Thomas, and Bradley, did their job. The question was who else would basically get the job done. And in this case, it was Crowder going for over 20 points. So the Celtics, this was a good win knowing that you're playing a good team in this case. It has a couple of legit players. They got some good big guys down low. And you ended up uh, losing the rebounding battle, but you only lost it by uh three thirty five to thirty two which that I can accept you know so I can accept the win you know and it's, but again Crowder's got to be able to show that type of uh you know performance on a more consistent basis not wait for something to piss him off in order for him to actually play like an all-star he's got to play like an all-star game in and game out uh excellent stuff and I will finish uh, uh that Jay Crowder tied uh, his career high with 21 points uh, against the Utah Jazz and now he's 14 in the NBA in three points percentage. He's, he, he was 14 after that game. Uh, Celtics are 10 and 2 since Thomas came back from the injury drawing. Not a coincidence and against the Utah uh, so hot right now the last 10 games the last i mean last two uh not not included the games against philadelphia and against uh, uh pelicans but uh, the 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 last 10 games before that uh 31 points and 51.3 percent field goal 41.9 percent three-point shooting, free throws, 94%, assist per game, uh, 6.9. Uh, the Celtics, 8-2 and two over that 10 games, 10 games win span. And Isaiah Thomas right now is 28 points per game and fourth in the NBA. Isaiah Thomas had 29 points and 15 assists. And the Celtics stumped on Utah's elite defense and Isaiah Thomas tied career high with 13 assists and now his career high 15 assists. He has his third double-double in the season and new career high 15 assists and after Jay Crowder 
missed close layup in the third. Thomas spun towards op op opposite best baseline. Crowder got fouled in the play anyway, but Thomas appeared to share some words with his teammate from the hacker. With a wave, he might have been saying, how did you mess up that assist? And as far as I'm aware, the Celtics do not have any inter internal beef growing, but they could joke with each other as they ruined the Utah Jazz elite defense and tipped off the new year with 115-104 victory, their largest win since December 7th of the day. Joe Johnson, Utah Jazz, kept things from getting out of, uh, of uh, Kent during the fourth, but the Celtics replied every time Utah tried to seize the real comeback opportunity. Thomas swayed into the third pointer and Al Horford uh, popped into a couple of key buckets and uh, Ivory Bradley drained a pair of four quarter triples and keep the lead near the double digits or above. This wasn't the Celtics' most successful defensive effort, but it doesn't matter because they never stopped scoring. Um, Thomas followed 52 points performance uh, be the game before with uh, turns on the Thomas can still do magnificent things on the basketball court. The middle finish might have been the craftiest this season, but he has left trail competition there. During the first, he wrecked 14 points and 7 assists, 6 of 10 shooting. He could actually been seen smiling one time and the Jazz left him wide open on the court when he picked up his 13 assists midway through the third. Thomas tied career high and that time he had yet to commit a single turnover. By the end of night he had 29 points, 15 assists and 10 of 18 shooting. Not a bad anchor after best scoring night in career Friday night and um, crowd let him know what with late MVP shots which have become common in the garden. Utah entered Tuesday night with number two defense no matter because the Celtics dice them, Thomas did what Thomas does. Crowder, 21 points, 6 of 8 shooting, 5 of 6 for 3. Declined to miss 3 points on attempt until the final 2 minutes. And Horford put the fourth pleasant 21 points, 9 of 6 in shooting against one of NBA's most imposing front lines. Rudy Gobert, 8 points, 13 rebounds. And Horford outscored Gobert, 21 points, did some plan altering down low. Gordon Hayward, 22 points, showed how many ways he can impact the basketball game. Boris Diaw, 15 points, threw plenty of buckets of the Utah Jazz. But still the second, the Celtics put the ball in the bucket. And not to forget Derek Favors. They entered halftime with 54, 54, uh, 54 um, 45 lead, extended it during the third, and responded every time the Jazz threatened to close the gap. In the fourth, 16 threes made uh, on 31 attempts, tied that point season high for the Celtics. Hayward did plenty of things early for the Jazz, and the Celtics looked locked from the tip. Thomas curled into the line for contested jumper, jumper in the first possession. Crowder followed with a pair of threes. Horford unleashed a beautiful sequence in, in which he forced airball from Rodney Hood. When, when um, then beat everyone down the floor with transitional dunk. Two minutes in the floor, the Celtics seized uh, 10 and 4 advantage and forced Utah to call timeout. The Jazz never recovered. Um, and um, this was also awesome sequence. Recovery and for the block, stare down, trail a, a pair of hook step, lefty and one, check, 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 Brown, 10 points, 4 of 6 shooting, proceeded to storm Raul Neto in the post, metaphorically speaking, moments after this sequence. And generally, he had night, a beautiful night, despite leaving his feet uh, for one very rookie turnover. And the Celtics had nice night too. And with this segment, Danny, we finish recapping the three games. And we are coming to one uh, fun part of the show, and those are articles, rumors, future 
of the of the franchise. I have one, but uh, before uh, this one, uh, uh, I mean, uh, do you have something more? Do you want me to start with uh, th that our last sequence? Well, in regards to the game, we'll just say that technically, the Celtics did a monster performance in that game against Mac Hood and Gobert, and that was the difference, you know. They didn't, you know, they allowed Hayward to go off and uh, Favors managed to have a pretty good game. But you managed to stop Gobert, Mack, and Hood from having the performances that they're used to. And that's the only reason really that you won is the fact that you held those guys down to nine points or less, each and every one of them. If it wasn't for that, you probably would have lost this game. So you got to give credit to... Um, in this situation to the guards and to um to, to to the center so in this case Horford Thomas and Bradley and Smart because those guys managed to take care of their their positions it was only uh, Amir Johnson pretty much and Crowder who allowed their guys to basically have some big nights yeah and update um, standings River Cavaliers number one uh, 27 8 Toronto, number two, 24-12, 66.7%. Uh, three and a half games be behind Cleveland. Boston, number three, 23 and 14, 62.2%. Five games behind uh, Cavaliers and two and a half, and one and a half games behind Toronto. Like you said, if Toronto loses Houston and we defeated them, we can be tied with them uh, at the Tuesday night, which is beautiful. Atlanta had uh, 21 and 16 fourth. Indiana number five. Uh, Charlotte number uh, six. Seven Milwaukee and number eight Chicago Bulls. And uh, those were up updated uh, standings. Now, like I said, we are starting the rumors, the articles, and the future of the franchise sequence. Let me, let me start, Danny, <clears throat> because we are all hoping for the, um, I mean, big trade deadline. But at least I'm hoping that he will, Danny Ainge will bring the center. But as Bulls explore Jimmy Butler trade market, trade for Hoisberg's headache months. Um, poor Fred Hoiberg. Two years ago, he took over 50 wins team that pushed the Cavaliers to six games in the conference semifinals and might have done more damage if not harm string injury to Paul Gasol. But when he got to Chicago, um, he was not given a roster of hard-headed veterans who were never really on board with the decision to let Tom Thibodeau go and replace him with Hoiberg. Now, even 50%, and in Tikov in the playoff race, number eight, the Bulls are settling, setting mess. They blew the one chance they had giving Koiber a clean state, slate, last of season, and now they're trying to dig their way into the hole. They are all already banished Rajon Rondo, one of their top free agents' acquisitions this summer, from rotations, and according to Bleacher Report, they're making Jimmy Butler available in the trade ahead of next month's deadline. The team devolved badly into the Hoiberg first season, and the Bulls were poised in the offseason to com complete wide clean its slate, beginning with a trade of Derrick Rose to the Knicks, which also signed Bulls uh, Joachim Noah, and the feeling in Chicago last year was that Hoiberg, his rookie coach, has too little power in dealing with uh, the interest of veteran players, and that youth movement would allow him to rebuild the team without being undermined. Um, to the end, the Bulls nearly traded Butler just ahead of the draft because Boston had number three pick, and Minnesota had number five. Both teams had interest in Butler, 
who had not been easy personality for Hoiberg to manage. That came to four in December 15, when Butler criticized Hoiberg for being too soft on the team, while Butler la later added that he would make it work with Hoiberg. The veterans in Chicago were never truly on the board with the Hoiberg, but the Bulls pulled back the reins of sweeping rebuilt and the Butler trade then quickly reversed course altogether. They surprised many by signing Rondo and no known teaser of uh, coaching patience then pulled another shocker by Dwayne Wade from, uh, coming from Miami. From giving Koiberg a young bunch of uh, uh, to mold, the Bulls buried him, buried him with uh, more, uh, more strong-willed veterans. And now the front office, uh, Gar Foreman and John Paxson, uh, to dig out of the rubble of the last summer's mistakes. They are likely to keep Rondo through the trade deadline in hopes of moving him as a part of larger package in the next seven weeks. But uh, that could prove a long shot instead of post-deadline buyout must be the way to move Rondo. Butler will have much more um, receptive market, but the Bulls are expected to ask for a massive return. Joe, Joe, they are not in the great position to demand. Butler is having monster season, 25.2 points per game, 6.8 rebounds per game, 4.5 4 assists per game, and there is no doubt that um, there will be a long list of suitors. Thibodeau still would love to bring him to Minnesota. There will be interesting from Lakers and Boston too. But the Bulls will have difficult task to pull away a mid-season blockbuster when the teams know that they are desperate to do that. And um, it's what makes summer all more um, harder. The Bulls were in the position to make Butler trade that would have landed them top five picks as a set. Now it's a larger bullet. This is expected to be stronger draft class and without the security of knowing how the lottery will pay out, the teams are more leery about trading picks. On the flip side, a strong closing run by whichever teams picks up the picks the Bulls might acquire and bad luck on lottery night could mean the Bulls wind up with uh, a lottery that falls out of top five. This could have gone much better for Bulls. And uh, I mean, I will stop there. I have, uh, the, this was the Bulls' perspective about uh, the trade, the potential trade of the Jimmy Butler now or at the summer. And now uh, they are exploring the market for Jimmy Butler, and we know that he is one of the top uh, small forwards at the East. Uh, I mean, desirable man. And what is your take on the whole situation with Jimmy Butler then? The bad thing about this whole thing with Jimmy Butler is the fact that the Bulls can't make up their mind whether they want to keep him or whether they, whether they want to get rid of him. We've been seeing reports about that that the people in the Bulls organization are literally split on whether to actually get rid of him. Some are saying they should trade him and basically start to build around Dwayne Wade, which in my opinion, I understand Dwayne Wade is a superstar and all that, but come on, the guy is closer to the end of, the, end of his career than he is to his prime, and yet you want to basically let go of someone like Butler to then go building around Dwayne Wade. You know, it wasn't working in Miami once LeBron and them left, which is why he ditched Miami to go somewhere else to try and make a superstar, you know, combination. And you're going to try to get rid of a superstar you got to basically build around him. So, you know, if Miami, if the Chicago Bulls basically want to go to a rebuilding mode of their own, fine. But like you said, there's not going to be too many teams in the in the NBA that are going to have all the valuable assets that the Bulls want you know, in order to basically give up Jimmy Butler. But, you know, the few teams that do have it, which the Celtics are one of those teams that have the assets because they have the contracts that are expiring. They got the draft picks available. 
in particular the ones with the Brooklyn Nets, you know, the, the Chicago Bulls, if there's any team they should be looking to, it should be the Boston Celtics, knowing that technically you're not in a position right now, as you said, basically to really be making any overwhelming demands. Second, your team is not going anywhere this season, so he's really not looking that good when it comes to basically, you know, being able to say I can lead a team somewhere because you're not doing it right now and you got Dwayne Wade there helping you, you know, so yeah, you come to the Celtics team, you're going to be doing better, you know, you're going to be able to put up your numbers because you got Thomas and Horford helping you. So you're not really a number one like a LeBron James or Kevin Durant or Russell Westbrook type player. So we're not going to give up as much as we would for those players in order to get you. So, you know, that's another situation that the Bulls are going to have to deal with. But you're better off getting rid of him now because once the once the season ends, you're going to have plenty of superstars on the free agent market. And there's going to be plenty of teams that will have salary cap space. And the Bulls are not going to be able to make a deal that where they can get as much during the offseason as they might be able to get to get get for him now, especially knowing that there's teams that are trying to knock off Cleveland and knock off the Golden State Warriors that could basically use that piece to help them, especially in this case, the Raptors and the Celtics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we will <clears throat> we will discuss uh, uh, the latest the, the latest happenings on the trade. Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, what is happening at the East too among our. Uh, Opponents, biggest opponents at the East, Cavaliers acquired a forward from Atlanta in one ridiculous trade for Atlanta. And Toronto may acquire Paul Wilson because Atlanta is one bad organization that doesn't know what they are doing. Anyway, Boston Celtics trade rumors, Danny Ainge exploring options with Brooklyn Nets picks. Pick. But things top of the draft is deep. On way one way or another, Boston Celtics should not should be in good shape on the draft this year. If they keep the Boston uh, Brooklyn Nets pick uh, 2017, they will acquire lottery talent from the deep draft. If they trade, they should be able to add another established star. And that's what we are hoping for here at the Celtics Stock Radio. This, um, Celtics, because if I have to choose between the veteran guy and potential star, but we, we don't know what he will be, you know, I will always choose established player. And that's what I have been saying on the show every time. But now, the Celtics president of basketball operations, Danny Ainge, We'll have plenty of Celtics, uh, plenty of uh, options. During the radio interview, he said opposing teams have begun to call him about the next pick, but uh, he is nothing close, or, or nothing is close or imminent. Yeah, there, they, 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 there are people calling me. Said Ainge, it's valuable pick, so we are going to explore it. Ainge is also evaluating all the top prospects if the Celtics season uh, ended after Wednesday night games. The Celtics uh, would own the best odds of landing number one overall, thanks to the rights to swap pick with Brooklyn Nets. And the reporters ask Ainge generally uh, whether this draft generally considered rich in talent is deep, deeper than... Uh, last couple drafts. Every draft is different, said Ainge. I think that uh, sometimes you have uh, the top one is better than other drafts or two. This one is a little bit more equal in the uh, top few picks of the draft. As it, uh, This one is a little bit more equal in the top few picks of the draft in quality as it appears right now. This is something that we are spending our time on. We have, we have people all over the world evaluating our picks and talents. So I think uh, in this point of time, I think that, yeah, there is four 
of the five guys, there is not a lot of separation in the draft. Ainge also said he has not talked to Isaiah Thomas nor Ivory Bradley about possible contract extensions. Both will be eligible for extensions this summer if the Celtics remain under the cap, but they have made it clear they would like to chase the top three agents. Those are the things they uh, that can happen until the summer time anyway. Isaiah knows that uh, we love him. He loves playing in Boston and he knows that we love him as well. Same as Ivory. I think they are a good combination. Both of the guys know how much we appreciate them as a players and all they've done and what they become. Became, become, became. So yeah, uh, there is going to be a time when we will sit down and have conversations with all of our guys. But in the meantime, we are trying to build a championship caliber team. I want you, Danny, um, what does it mean that he is cherishing his pick? Do you think that he's playing hard uh, when we talk about the other teams and their offers for the pick? When it comes to Danny Ainge, we've seen, you know, throughout uh, his history, when he gets picks like that, that he knows are going to be super valuable, he always plays hard, you know, and basically wants to show that he values them, you know, big time. But we've also seen that uh, when it comes to him basically making trades with other teams, Danny Ainge is a player, uh, is basically a player in these games where he is not willing to make a move unless he basically feels that he is getting really uh, all-star, you know, caliber type changing player where he's giving up, you know, a bunch of players that mean virtually nothing in exchange for that player, kind of like what we had with the Kevin Gar Garnett deal. He gave up really the only key player in that deal that he gave up. The only one that meant anything at that time was Al Jefferson and then gave up a bunch of other players that really didn't mean much just to make the salary work to get KG to come this way. But here, yeah, yeah. you you since that time, every other deal Danny Ainge has gotten, he's pretty much tried to make it where he suckers the other team to basically give up their top give up their top stuff in order to take basically the garbage from us, as you as people would say, players that we really don't want or players that may not you know be as valuable as the player we're getting back from them. In exchange, you know, he did it with the with the deal against the Brooklyn Nets. We gave them Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce and Jason Terry in exchange for the players we got and the draft picks. And look at the, you know, Pierce, you know, KG and Terry. Those are three Hall of Fame players. Yeah, but they weren't able to do anything to help Brooklyn basically go anywhere when it came to them spending their time there. And all those guys ended up ditching the team to go elsewhere. It wasn't long. You know, so every, that's why everybody says that, you know, Danny Ainge suckered the nuts. Danny Ainge knew how much time those guys had left and knew those guys were not going to stay in Brooklyn. They were willing to stay in Boston because of the atmosphere, the fans, and the history of the team. But Brooklyn, there ain't nothing there in that arena and with those fans in New York. You know, it's a new, new team, new franchise, so there's no history there. So he knew those guys were not going to stay, so he got rid of them, basically, to start, you know, to fast-pace the, um, the, the rebuild. But right now you're in a position where you got only you you got only one draft pick this year in the first round because it's not that you got yourself your pick and theirs you got to swap your pick with them this year. So you're going to get theirs while they take yours. Next year is is the last pick you got from them where you'll have your pick and their pick unless you know things are set up where you got to give your pick away to somebody else. Right now this is probably the best opportunity, in my opinion, Danny Ainge is going to have to make a deal for a superstar because you're going to have two lottery picks in all likelihood to actually go the route of getting a superstar. For all we know, Igor, there ain't no guarantee Brooklyn's going to stink next year and you're going to get another lottery pick from them. They're the worst team right now, at least record-wise, as far as I know, um, this season. So you're pretty much guaranteed if 
things keep going the way they're going, that you're going to get a, a you know a top four pick this year in the lottery. You're guaranteed that for right now if they finish the season in the last place. Yeah, the worst team right now, at least record-wise, as far as so, I know, um, you got to go the route of cashing in now because if they get just one superstar to come to this team in Brooklyn next year, you know, whether it be through free agency or something like that, your chances of being able to make a trade next season with that last pick from the Nets goes down dramatically because teams are going to know it's not a lottery pick. So why should we give you our superstar for a pick that may not even be in the lottery itself? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I agree. Uh, before going uh, uh, to the uh, next uh, article, I agree with you. Uh, I think that definitely 2017 uh, draft, uh, prior to the draft, until this draft, uh, I mean, from now until the draft is ended, I think this is the best opportunity for Danny Ainge to bring us the third star. Jimmy Butler or whomever, we will talk about a couple of other names, but uh, after we drafted that pick 2017, I don't know, Danny, I think that we have 2018 Nets pick, but we don't know uh, how good this draft will be, and we don't know what pick we will get. We can hope that we will have, for example, top 10 picks, but we don't have assurance and we know that we will have potentially top five picks with Brooklyn Nets being bad enough this year, right? Yep. And, and as, of uh, right now, as of right now, I'm looking at the information for our draft picks, our future draft picks. As of right yeah. now, the Celtics ha do have their own pick and the Nets pick next year in round one. So, again, everybody, this is the 2018 draft we're talking about, not the 2017. But the 2018 yeah. draft, they have their own pick and the Nets pick in round one. Yeah. After that, Igor, they have nothing They have nothing else. They have the set the round, their yeah. own pick in round two, um, but they traded it to the Thunder. But it's... Uh, it has protection, top 55, meaning that if yeah. the pick goes in the 56 to, to 60th, then the pick basically will go to the Oklahoma City Thunder. If not, it yeah. stays with us. So right now, you can basically go the route of, let's just say Danny Ainge does get a superstar of some sort in free agency. You're in a position where pretty much you're looking at only the two first round picks and that's it. You ain't gonna have nothing else in round in the second round. So if you don't make a deal this season or this, you know, or during the summer at least, before before the um draft itself, you could potentially be looking at a situation where your team is too good next year to have a lottery pick from your own pick and Brooklyn for all you know may not be may not be bad enough to where they're getting you a lottery pick. So you have no lottery picks, period, next year if Brooklyn improves yeah. themselves and you basically squandered that deal with the Brooklyn Nets because of the fact that you weren't willing to pull the trigger on just anybody. Yeah, and uh, let's remind uh, our listeners and viewers that the new CBA, according to the uh, videos that we played uh, from uh, Eric Pinkus, uh, Pinkus, the insider, uh, NBA Insider, I mean, uh, uh, the new CBA will favor uh, the teams that are rebuilding through the draft. Anyway, uh, we can hope for top five picks right now and eventually top five or top ten picks pick from the Nets 2018 draft. Beyond that, we don't have the assets, we don't have picks, so uh, we have potentially this draft and eventually the next draft where we can have and trade some players. Is that correct, Danny? Yeah, pretty much. This draft this year, which is the only one that's guaranteed for the most part, unless the Brooklyn Nets make some sort of uh, miracle transition within the next uh, few months before the end of the season, this year will be guaranteed to be a lottery pick in this case. But next year we can't. They can't. Danny Ainge can guarantee nothing, which is why Danny Ainge is better making a move 
before next month's trade deadline or at least the once during the summer because once he uses that that pick at this year at the summer's uh NBA draft then the pick is gone and you can pretty much say you've wasted because there ain't no team out there that's going to basically be willing to give up its superstar next year knowing the way the new CBA is going to be going, knowing that they're going to have the chance to keep their superstars thanks to the money that's going up and all the new regulations that are helping these teams keep their stars because the NBA wants to prevent teams from making these superstar teams. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, what's the Celtics trade rumors? Jimmy Butler is gettable for the Brooklyn Nets pick report. From the report from Blitzer, Blitz reporter Rick Butcher surfaced from Chicago Bulls are listening to the offers on the superstar wing Jimmy Butler. Speculation run rampant about potential packages that could bring the all-star in the top 10 or 20 best player in the league to the Boston. Zach Lowe, speaking on the podcast, said he's one of the best informed basketball thinkers in the media, said his theory is that Butler is indeed gettable, and mentioned Boston Celtics speculations as desirable destination. The prize is hefty though. Here is Lowe. I don't think there is much real happening with Jimmy Butler. My theory, and um, you could speak to this too, Kevin Arnowitz, I think I want to see if they can get the Nets pick from Boston, the Chicago Bulls. I think this is all just like, let's throw it out and see if we, if we can get just smart Crowder, the Nets pick, and if we can get that, then we are talking. The smart Crowder and the Nets pick. If we can get that, then we are not talking. I think Jimmy Butler is gettable. And I think um, Jimmy Butler is gettable, and uh, it just has to be absolutely monstrous offer. And we are going to have this happen once every three months. Like Nets pick, Nets pick, Nets pick. And the 2017 and 2018 Brooklyn Nets draft picks. The Celtics swap picks with the Brooklyn in 2017. And they own our own pick uh, 2018. And the Nets pick uh, unprotected remain uh, some of the best potential trade assets in the league. So it makes sense that the Bulls would require uh, one to even think about dealing Butler. Uh, one of 2017 or 2018 Nets pick. And then I would offer them 2018 pick. For example, unprotected. After all, uh, building around a player that might be top 10 star in the league is reasonable strategy. And if the Bulls can get top talent, they have no reason to move on. Uh, that price would be hefty for Boston, though, and not just because the picks we will get to those in a minute. Smart and Crowder are both very valuable players who help them um, team to his identity. Identity the Butler would certainly add to if joined the squad. The Celtics are known as tough, defensive-minded team, and while they haven't always embodied reputation, they seem to get back to their style in a few weeks. Butler, um, however, is uh, having absolute unbelievable season. 25 points per game, around seven rebounds. It's worth wondering how good Butler could be if it's surrounded with the better players. For example, better than uh, not aging Wade and Rondo. He's super athletic, creative as a slasher, extra dangerous in transition. He also getting uh, to the line almost 10 times per game, making 88% of the, from the line of the attempts. And add to that his high intensity defense, and it's easy to see why the Celtics might go at it. Looking uh, purely to last potential uh, potential package, uh, which was just a theory to be clear, but love theory is generally very good. The Celtics would maintain the bulk of their current core, simply swapping Crowder for Butler. Butler uh, is improvement over Crowder, 
and he would get plenty of opportunities playing next Thomas, who draws considerable moles, defensive attention to the Derek Rowe, than the Derek Rose and Rondo would ever get. In addition, Butler would give the Celtics more solid rebounding from the wings um, uh, to go alongside Bradley. Perhaps not enough to totally fix issues, but they will be better rebounding team. For the Celtics, however, everything comes back to Cleveland. Thus, swapping powder for Butler with added heat to losing smart makes Boston legit contenders to the Eastern Conference. When the Cleveland added Corver, it's difficult to say. Smart and Crowder both have a lot of great things for the team, and Butler is real star, but uh, James is formidable. Cleveland is still the favorites. Is potentially acquiring uh, the mere puncher chance were the pick for the uh, were uh, lose the pick from the Nets. Um, that might be mood point. Butler is good. Uh, that Chicago might be simply to decide to keep the bill around him. Eliminate the questions completely. But if the rumors keep up popping um, at the trade deadline, if the Celtics keep winning at the rate, then the Ainge is going to have some difficult and visible decisions to make feb before February 23rd. What is your take on that? La uh, I mean, Zach La Law is uh, uh, saying that uh, practically it's not worth trading for, I mean... Um, Butler, because the the Cavaliers are still favorites when they added Kyle Corver. I mean, I strongly disagree with that. What about you? Well, in my opinion, you know, our buddy there has got to realize that no matter what happens, the Cavaliers are always going to be the favorites because in this league, it's all about the ratings, as I've said many times before throughout the years we've been doing this. The league will make sure that they get what they want, which is the Cavaliers, LeBron and company going at it with Kevin Durant and the Warriors in round three of the of their matchup, basically three years in a row. After this, who knows, maybe they finally decide to give it, you know, to finally put it aside and basically know that the fans, you know, are getting tired of seeing the exact same matchup every year in the finals. You know, this is where I say the Chicago Bulls, unfortunately, did did many fans an injustice by trading Kyle Korver over to the Cavaliers because, if anything, you should be trying to prevent the Cavaliers and the Warriors from getting better, knowing that it's already a two-team league pretty much as it is. If anything, you give Corver to somebody else, knowing that you gave him for virtually nothing in this case, you give him to some you give him to somebody else that can use him to try and make a run to stop the Cavaliers or to stop the Warriors out west. Don't give him to the two teams that are already at the top, knowing that that's just going to make it even more of a one-sided, you know, situation for either either team, which whichever one you send him to, whether it's the Cavs or the Warriors. You know, so to me, I wouldn't be surprised if they say that the NBA had some sort of influence, basically behind the scenes, if the Bulls got something else out of this, basically behind closed doors, in order to send Corver over there. But in my opinion, you know. No matter who we get, we're not really going to get past the Cavaliers, you know. We might yeah. just be able to give them a run for their money, and that would be basically the best situation. Right now, it's us in Toronto. That's what I'm really thinking about because technically – this whole season is all about making a statement and showing the free agents we are capable of basically m making a performance where we can actually make a run next year to beat LeBron and the Cavaliers with the right players in order to actually then beat the Warriors in the finals if it's done and win a championship. Let players that are going to be free agents realize that this isn't just a two-team league where each and every year it's only the Warriors and the Cavaliers and you got to choose one of those two teams in order to have a shot. There's 30 teams in this league. Those are just two. You have plenty of other teams you can look to to actually try and win. And there's several teams that are basically capable of giving those teams a run for their money if you're willing to go to them and take your talents to them. So if you get Butler in this case, 
that gives you another legit player who's capable of having big time performances. You have him, you have Horford, you have Thomas, you have Bradley in your starting lineup. That right there is enough to combat LeBron, Irving, and Kevin Love and their performances with those guys. The question now comes down, what does everybody else from the bench basically do? Now, in my opinion, Igor, if we were to go this route, if the Bulls want to make it where they get our Brooklyn picks, if I was Danny Ainge, I would go to the Bulls and I would basically say this, fine, you want to make a move where you basically it looks like you're going into a rebuild mode, you give us both Jimmy Butler and Todd Gibson. We give you Crowder, Smart, Amir Johnson, and both Brooklyn picks. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, um, I, I said let's give them 2018 pick, for example. Let's try to preserve 2017 pick. If not, I would still do the trade. Losing Smart would hurt. But Butler is upgrade, um, you know, over Crowder. And it is ridiculous from Zach Law to say, because, hey, Cleveland Cavaliers have the secured place in the Eastern Conference Finals this season and the next season. So every team should not, you know, make the team to run with the Cavaliers. Every team should rebuild in the East. This is ridiculous statement. I mean, now that Cavaliers uh, traded for Corver, the Celtics should not make the championship caliber team. This is a ridiculous statement. That's what I'm talking The Celtics should make the best team they can get. Now, the next season, the season after that. And eventually, the, the Cavs will not be contenders. It cannot last the next 10 years. It can last three years, Four years Cavaliers and Golden State Warriors era, you know, because LeBron James is not a robot, he's a human, and he is in late 30s, you know, he is like 32 to 33, if I'm correct. So we are going to get to contendership territory. Just make the contender team and wait you know, until Cavaliers dissolve. When LeBron James is gone, Cavaliers are gone from the surface of the NBA. And this is just the way it is. And like you said, I mean, come on. If you trade Marcus Smart and Jay Crowder, and I told you, I would trade even 2017 and 2018 pick for Butler. And if you have Isaiah Thomas, Ivory Bradley, Butler, Horford, and who else? Amir Johnson, let's say. Doesn't matter. We will search for the better power forward. We can get even better bench than some free agents. I, I, I don't know. The Bogut or somebody else, they will come to Boston. And we will have even, even better bench the next summer, you know? And we will get even better. This is just the way it is. And so I say, like you said, if the Bulls really want to trade him, because I'm not sure, <laughs> you say they are changing their mind, just like the bride. But uh, let's say that Zach Lowe is correct and he is gettable for the first rounder. I say do it. Right? Yep, and like I said, the deal that I just mentioned, Crowder, Smart, Amir, and the pit, the two picks for the um, for Gibson and, and Butler, just looking at the salaries in this case and what it would mean. Right now we know we're scheduled to where we would have money for one match for the agent next summer if we were to keep things the way they are right now. If we don't go the route of making a trade, we have the draft pick that we got to basically use. That takes up part of our money, of course. Um, but Jimmy Butler is scheduled to make $18.6 million next year. Let's just say roughly $18.7 million. 
you basically are sending away Amir Johnson, who's going to make $12 million. This is something where the Bulls might be willing to go through with it. Because right now, Amir Johnson makes $12 million this year. His contract is set to expire. Jay Crowder makes $6.2 million. He only goes up to $6.7 million next year. And then Marcus Smart is at $3.5 million. He goes up to four point five. So next year, between him and Crowder, they're going to be making roughly about $12 million. When it comes to Butler and them, Butler, like I said, makes 18.7. Gibson's contract expires. So technically, not only are they getting the draft pick, that could be a lottery pick, but we're also helping them cut their salary cap, which could help them basically go the route of maybe making a move to get somebody else that they think they might want to put with Dwayne Wade. So this thing makes would make sense for them. And when it comes to, you know, for us, you get Jimmy Butler, which is your superstar right there. That means for this season, you have a starting lineup of Todd Gibson at the, at the power forward, Al Horford at center, um, Jimmy Butler at the small forward, Avery Bradley at the shooting guard, Isaiah Thomas, at the point guard. Now, of course, maybe Danny Ainge could spring a move for somebody else, you know, another, you know, backup guard, unless we decide to let Terry Rozier be the one to do it the rest of the way off the bench, which is also po always possible. But think about what that makes for next season. You, you would have Al Horford, Isaiah Thomas, Avery Bradley, and Jimmy Butler. All four, four of those guys would still be under contract, Igor, for the next ye for next year at least in this case you would still have even though B butler takes up roughly 18 million he takes up 18 million pretty much but in reality sure. because you're getting rid of smart and crowder he's only taken up roughly 8 8 million dollars more than what those two guys were going to take from you if you kept them meaning that you already have your superstar to go in the lineup the starting lineup so you wouldn't need the superstar that maximum money you was going to have. Now you just take away from it to start building up the bench and try to get the bench ready with the role players you need to actually make a run. And this is where now you're looking at what, what's happening to LeBron and Domingo, and you're looking at what's happening to Golden State. You're wow. seeing all the, all the players for those teams that are taking chump change, penny on the dollars, in order to go to those teams because they want an easy route to the championship and are saying, we'll take pennies on the dollar to play for you because we know that your superstars will lead us to a championship. Well, now we have the four players we need that will be the superstars of this team. If you can't, you can't go to Cleveland now, you can't go to Golden State because those teams already have their teams at the maximum money because of all their superstars taking up all the cash. We have our stars, but because our stars are underpaid compared to those guys being paid the max, we have the money we can give you to come this way. So you can come and play for us, and at the same time, we'll still be able to give our guys the max money they want when their contracts expire. So right uh, now, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And the other issue is, uh, should Kelly Olenek be re-signed? Olenek is tantalizing prospect as one of the easy uh, to see why the Danny Ainge drafted in 13, in the draft, 2013. Seven feet, he can shoot from the perimeter, he's great feet, he can also put the ball on the floor and get the easy back. Now, Olenek's versatility is the premium in today's NBA game. Just take a look at NBA uh, top teams, Golden State Warriors. Uh, and one, we will see effectiveness of shooting proves by the front court players like Durant and Green. Uh, Kelly is prototypical, prototypical pick and pop uh, big guys. And given the Celtics current situation, and this being contract year of the Kelly Olenek, um, the question is, should the Celtics aim to re-sign the big man? And after two seasons, an average double-double in points, 10.3 and 10, 10 to game. Kelorinik begin the season with eight points per game. His rebounding is down to four points. Uh, from point, uh, Rebounding is down from uh, 4.7 to 4.2. Uh, defense is better. 
and uh, almost alarming three-point shoot shooting is down from 40 for the last season to 34.8. Injuries may have um, part of this. After missing the games, uh, he's trying to re-establish himself. And Al Horford uh, is premier pick-and-pop guy himself. It may be affected to efficiency and frequency of pick-and-pop touches by Olivi. The Celtics maintain the future salary cap flexibility by not extending Olinic by November 30th. Unless uh, he is packaged in the trade scenarios, the Celtics will certainly extend Olinic as qualifying offer uh, 4.27 million by June 30th in the dra- in, um, to ensure he becomes restricted free agents. Again, unless he is packaged into the trade, the Celtics will extend qualifying offer 4.27 million by June 30th, ensuring he is restricted free agent. Now, that move will likely be mere formality, and it's highly likely that the suitor will be found for Linux versatile services. Um, one that Boston would be unlikely to match. In the new CBA, 4 million is literally very small. Another um, thing to consider is Boston's top draft pick 2017 that Boston owns. A top three pick in the draft could land Boston superstar forward, for example, Duke's 610 Gilles. Draft super talent, a rookie contract, uh, and at Kelly position would be much more appealing than over 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 uh, paying for Olenek's services. While Olenek is nice, versatile player that can help any club, his value is will be big. And Olenek's greatest contribution to box success could be in packaging into trade. Um, and for example, similar trade uh, happened 2006-7. Ran Gomez shown flashes, but. Uh, Ainge uh, built championship contender. Uh, Gomez went on to have solid career as second rounder. And I mean, do, do, do you think the Celtics can just, should just extend the offer for Olinik while negotiating with the other top three agents, Danny, and then wait? Yeah, it would make sense because just extending him the qualifying offer to make him a restricted free agent doesn't guarantee doesn't mean you automatically have to resign him and at the same time he doesn't have to resign with you if he doesn't want to so you know that's just making sure that you at least have the right to basically match whatever offer he gets from another team before he actually walks away and leaves you high and dry so i would do it just to basically you have a chance to speak with him before he walks away and at the same time you tell him you know we'll, we'll see you one more time before you leave if you decide to go somewhere else but we're gonna let you go ahead you test the free agency market and we're gonna go and we'll see what we can do to get ourselves a superstar somewhere and we'll eventually meet with you once you feel like you've basically spoken to all your suitors and then we'll talk with you and see what we're willing to offer you. And then you can make a decision after you've spoken to us and everybody else. And if you decide to walk away, then we'll wish you, you know, well in your future endeavors with your new team. If you decide to resign with us, then fine. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll hope that everything works out, c- continues to work out with us. But it's better than you basically letting him be an unrestricted free agent and losing him for absolutely nothing. Because at least if you keep him as a restricted and he walks out and goes somewhere else, you're guaranteed to get something back, you know, from another team. Um, excellent stuff, Danny. Uh, I will not talk uh, about the. I will not. Uh, I will not talk about. Uh, uh, you know, the Marcus Cousins. I just want to talk about the latest and the most important news. Ivory Bradley might be the most popular Celtics guard among the front offices. But we heard Danny, then Danny Ainge is cherishing uh, Ivory Bradley, and I'm sure that he would not give up uh, lightly Ivory Bradley. And we could even extend him, as we heard, but Danny Ainge said that uh, we will negotiate with the other free agents practically before 
uh, you know, negotiating with their own players, uh, trying to build championship caliber team. Paul Mills of trade rumors. Atlanta Fox could deal the star. Would the Celtics have interest? Atlanta reportedly fielding calls on power forward Paul Milson, according to ESPN, which is cryptic way of saying that they're open to trading them. In other words, the Hawks letting team known that Milson feels available in the hopes of starting a bidding war for the services of 31 years old, with average 18 points and almost 8 rebounds per game. The Hawks reportedly made a deal for Corver and Tavo Sefolosha available in the trade talks alongside Milsom. Milsom is intriguing piece for several teams, including Toronto Raptors, Denver Nuggets, both of whom reportedly expressed the interest. For Nuggets, Milsom will be a leg legit star, some, some, something Denver lacks. Denver has enormous collection of young talents that could easily be moved in the package. For Toronto, Millsap will be attempt to become real contender and even mounting of assets that Toronto would have to move to acquire him. And exactly um, B, A, highly versatile additions that could slide into the next of Toronto's fantastic backcourt, Laurie and DeRozan. Millsap's skill set wide as wind which makes him excellent power forward. He can score all over the court, facing up from trees, slashing to the basket. Defensively, his size, athleticism uh, could contain open men. So, Atlanta plan to dream up interest uh, for uh, Millsap is certainly going to be successful. The question is, what kind of package can Atlanta land? The Hawks demanded a nefty sum in the salary, and while the front office is likely more willing to move on a now, since Millsap will be unrestricted free agent in the summer, um, then to lose him like Al Horford. That makes Toronto path to Atlanta to move Millsap more difficult, given the Raptors still trying to contend for championship. While the core of the Rosen, Laurie Millsap is difficult, um, it will need talented role players. Millsap would require Terence Ross, Patterson, Norman Powell, two young guys, for example, to deal. Meanwhile, like uh, Denver would have better assets if Atlanta could shake them freely in the trade, even using Denver's name in discussion could be forced better off season out of opposing contenders who are trying to compete with the Nuggets. For the reason the Celtics almost invariously came up as potential star trades, given their prime assets and desire for the superstar. Reports about Millsap, however, are yet to include any mentions by Boston. That makes sense. We already known well Millsap and Horford pair together and complemented each other. They are in the core of a or championship contender. Even with upgrades at the point guards, uh, Ivan Bradley, Jay Crowder, Thomas, Adding Millsap likely doesn't make the Celtics better than the Cavaliers squad. And uh, uh, also, uh, it's also worth noting that the Celtics always have an eye on future flexibility. Acquiring Millsap would be a uh, commitment to offering him max deal in the offseason. That's a ton of money. And in the, if the 31-year-old uh, is the worth of um, uh, trade, uh, we will see what Ainge is thinking. Um, to pursue Millsap, uh, uh, which will allow the Celtics to move some of their young assets for an, another star. Keep an eye on Atlanta, what they could, could uh, move in the trade. And again, this is, this, this is again a ridiculous conclusion. I, I mean, um, Atlanta could not surpass uh, Cavaliers. So now the conclusion is the Celtics with Orford and Millsap could not, not surpass the Cavs. So, therefore, the Celtics should not trade for Millsap. I mean, come on, what is this? This is the joke of, of, of thinking. I mean, Millsap is two way big and legit all star. And those kinds of players are not growing on the trees. Tell me the better player that is available 
and I will say, go after him. But don't mention me in DeMarcus Cousins, because he will not make us contenders neither. And I would rather go over Paul Millsap than DeMarcus Cousins. What is your take on that? That's another thing that these uh, writers basically seem to fail and realize that you can only go for the players that are available, you know, because it takes two to tango when it comes to the trading, and you can't go trading for a player that a team is not willing to give up. You got to go after the players that are basically available because right now we're the ones that are desperate it's not the other teams the other teams basically they can keep these players and look to trade them at a later time so when it comes to Paul Millsap you know one thing that's good about him is that he and Al Horford and Jeff Teague and all those guys led the led the Eastern Conference last year they were number one in the Eastern Conference in terms of the record last year you know, so Al Horford has experience already with um, playing with Paul Millsap. So I would ask a lot of these guys, who do you prefer, Millsap or Amir Johnson? Millsap or Tyler Zeller? Millsap or Kelly Olynyk? You know, I'm pretty sure they, you know, other than Al Horford, most of these writers, if not all, should be saying they would take Paul Millsap over any other big we have on the on the roster right now. Now, can we say that we'll be willing to give up anything for Paul Millsap? No. You know, I would not be willing to give up the same amount of stuff I would be I would be willing to give up for Butler that I would for Paul yeah. Millsap, because technically, yeah. in my my opinion. The main position we need, other than the big, is the small forward because that's where a lot of the superstars are at. That's where LeBron's yeah. at. That's where Durant's at. That's where Carmelo's at. So you need somebody capable to defend those guys or at least match them point for point in order to negate their effectiveness. You know, but if I had to choose and I can say, okay, there ain't nothing else available, should we go after him? You know, yeah, because he's someone that basically can put up some big games, and he did it last year with Al Horford, so the two of them will only make this team better, especially if you can basically have him come into the starting lineup. But I am not giving up any of our key players for him, you know, which means technically, if you can tell me you give up maybe Amir Johnson, let's say someone like Jalen Brown, and maybe uh, next year's draft pick, fine. <laughs> But I am not giving up someone like, say, uh, Jay Crowder or Marcus Smart for someone like that with this year's draft pick, you know, because especially now, now that we saw what they took for Kyle Korver, and Korver was arguably the, you know, is one of the best three-point shooters in the game, and you took basically peanuts for him to send him to the best team in the in the Eastern Conference, there is no way you should be asking for a lot more you know, like an arm and a leg, basically, for Millsap when you took basically a bag of peanuts for Kyle Korver. And I will finish that uh, they have, uh, you know, all destinations for Millsap, like Raptors. Uh, the reports are that the Raptors want, uh, like, uh, help me, Danny, uh, Terence Ross and Patrick Patterson and uh, some uh, uh, two of the young guys plus the Peaks. Uh, the Nuggets can make the bigger package. The Thunder are there. Um, also Jazz. Also Wizards, Sports, Spurs. Nuclear op options, Cavaliers. But I think that option is out because uh, the Cavaliers made a trade for the uh, Carl Corver. You know. Now, uh, my question for you, uh, Danny, is, I mean... Um, the problem with Toronto that we discussed, uh, you and me, is that uh, if they trade for Millsap, A, they are losing uh, uh, Terence Ross and uh, Patrick Patterson, their key bench guy, probably. You know. Now, uh, is that making them contenders? And more likely, uh, are they capable to offer Millsap the re-signing? and the maximum contract, you know, they can try to form the big three, you know? And now, when they form the big three, they have yet to negotiate their star, Kyle Lowry, and the Mark DeRozan extension during to the new CBA salary cap. If I'm correct, 
I was looking, I may be wrong, you will correct me. Um, Kyle Lowry has uh, a, a, a player option at the end of this season. That means that if he opts out according to the new CBA and salary cap, which will be bigger and the maximum contracts will be bigger too, uh, Kyle Lowry will demand the much uh, bigger money than he is having right now. And the maximum contract, of course. And the Rosen will follow him. So, will the Raptors be able to match the salaries of three maximum contracts like Paul Millsap, Kyle Lowry, and Demar DeRozan in the future years without going over the cap and uh, saving uh, all the other key elements from the bench? I really don't think so. So, if they trade for Paul Millsap and gave up, uh, for example, uh, Patterson and Ross and the pick. And in the end, he didn't, for example, Paul Millsap doesn't commit to uh, resign. And, uh, for example, Celtics take, take Millsap at the free agency market. And the summer, Toronto would be the folks uh, at the end. So that is the catch about Toronto. Uh, Denver can make larger package and he will be the lone star. But uh, apparently Milsa prefers Toronto. Uh, this would potentially means that he would block any, any trades uh, to Denver, Sacramento, Jazz, or, 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 or elsewhere. You know? I, I think that he would probably love the Boston, but like you said, I would not give up two big packets for him. But uh, I would not like to see Millsap goes to Toronto this season. I will admit you to that, you know. I would like to see Boston adding the big guy, for example, like Chandler, Bogut, or um, even that guy, Tucker from Suns. And I would not like to see Toronto adding meals up on their roster. What about you? Well, when it comes to the information you was asking about, DeMar DeRozan is under contract next for next year at $27.7 million. He's under contract for the next four years, as a matter of fact. Uh, Kyle mm-hmm. Lowry, as you said, does have a player option for next year at $12 million. So he's making $12 million right now, Lowry. So that's yeah. kind of a slap in the face, you know. DeRozan's making fourteen million dollars more than Lowry, you know, and yet, you know, Lowry is, uh, you know, putting up just as much if, as if not more than De, than DeRozan when it comes to their oh. performances. Um, meanwhile, yeah. Millsap, he's got a player option for next year yes. for twenty one point four million dollars. So. Kyle Lowry, it basically, um, so Millsap, if he was to basically opt to take that money, you know, that player option, he would take it, and it would all come down, I guess, to Kyle Lowry. Can they bring him back? And if I'm correct, Lowry has been there long enough to actually qualify for the Larry Bird rights. And if that's the case, they would be able to go over the limit in order to resign him. And again, that's where this new salary cap also is coming into play because the salary cap has been made to make sure that teams like the Raptors will get to keep guys like Lowry and DeRozan rather than losing them to other teams. So, you know, Patterson is is making right now this season $6 million. Ross is making $10 million. So by getting rid of those guys and bringing in Millsap, they're basically losing the rap the Raptors would be losing roughly five million dollars, five point four million dollars in their salary cap space for next summer. But if they if they've got Larry Bird rights for, for uh Lowry, which I'm pretty sure they do already, then it really isn't gonna matter. Uh yeah, they can go over uh the salary cap to re sign the Lowry. Uh yeah, uh but Danny, I'm sure that he will opt, opt out, you know. Uh, I would be surprised if he didn't, if he doesn't opt out of the contract. 
because, like you said, he's underpaid and he is the prime star of the team. This is just normal thing. And we discussed the Millsap and the only thing that, uh, that is left is, uh, is you know, to discuss is uh, uh, what do you think about the Corvers trade? Do you understand it? I don't. From what I've been hearing, basically, for uh, Kyle Korver, um, they've been saying that uh, the teams were trying to get a third team to basically step in because it appears that the Chicago Pools were uh, not willing, or should I say they didn't want to take uh, Dunleavy from the um, Cleveland Cavaliers, but... Uh, no team, I guess the Hawks were the only idiots in the NBA, no team was willing basically to interfere and help the Cavaliers when it came to that part. So the Bulls realized they had no choice but to take them. But it appears that, um, that uh, Kyle Corver goes to the Cavaliers while uh, Mike Dunleavy Jr. goes to the Chicago Bulls. There was reports that uh, Mo Williams and the future first-round picks were going to the Hawks. So that's what the report is. So it's basically Mike Dunleavy, Mo Williams, and a future first-round pick to the Hawks. In exchange, Kyle Culver goes to the Cavaliers. I mean, this is just like giving the um, Cavaliers the player. I don't know is that pick... Uh, Let's suppose that it is top 10 pick, but still, it's still the steal for the Cavaliers, you know? And again, once again, the Cavaliers are willing and dealing their pet into the championship contenders. And you said everything, I don't have to repeat that in this league, everything is served for Cavaliers and Golden State Warriors to become again, uh, to enter the finals again. So, nothing to be surprised about and expect Warriors to be active prior to the trade deadline too. And, of course, Cavaliers will be stronger. And, of course, Atlanta Hawks were idiots to help them. They have bad management in years. And there is nothing, uh, there is nothing to be, you know, um, surprised about. And let's hope that, again, I will repeat as my closing word. This will be interesting summer for us. Let's make a run. Let's enter the finals, Eastern Conference finals, and I will be happy with this Celtics season. And if we can get Butler until the trade deadline, do it. And if or not, if not, at least make a move for one um, center like Bogut, please, Mr. Danny Ainge and make us a legit number two team at the East with addition of one legit center, backup center, we would be the team that can surpass Toronto Raptors at the Eastern Conference uh, semifinals. Uh, or when we meet them in, 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 in the playoffs. You know, because if we are second, and they are third, we will meet Toronto in the semifinals. Or we are, we are third and they are second. We will play with them for the finals anyway. It's my take. And those are my closing words. What about you? Well, like you said, in my opinion, Danny ain't just going to have to make a move. You know, Tuesday night, we'll basically find out a little bit more about this team. If this team is truly, you know, capable of being able to make some sort of noise against this Raptors team come playoff time. You know, we again, we we were, looked good against them the first game, but ultimately lost it in the, in the fourth quarter. This is going to be our second chance against them, a second time playing them. So uh, Celtics basically need to start uh, showing that they can compete with these top teams. You know, the good thing is that we still have the games against them here in uh, Boston, if I'm correct. Um, but uh, Danny Ainge, yeah, so, yeah, so Dan, but Danny more. Ainge has to go the route of basically making some sort of move. If you can't get somebody to basically take the small forward position, a superstar there, then try and get a decent upgrade, another decent big man, 
that will help Al Horford and Amir Johnson with the rebounding and all that. Because right now, we're relying too much on just a Linux, a Horford, and Amir Johnson. We're going too small at times because Brad Stevens has not learned to trust Tyler Zeller and Jordan Mickey. So if you're not going to go the route of trading for your superstar, at least trade for a decent big man, like you said, who can come in and basically be that fourth man of the from the big man department and try to help those guys get a better rotation yep. and try to help with the rebounding rules because we've been a much more better team. When we've won the rebounding battle and we haven't won the rebounding battle a lot this season because we've been playing so small. Okay. Uh, and Danny, uh, Three hours, we crossed three hours mark, uh, and it was really fun, Chet. Uh, thanks to Quap for support, and uh, uh, the people could see us live. Uh, Danny did magnificent techniques. I'm pretty happy with the show, and uh, this is live postgame set, set number two. Uh, we will inform you, Daniel, um, we'll think about uh, uh, when we are going to have the chat, probably around 28 between 28 and 30 a time eyeing after the show number 155 because the next two shows of Celtic Talk radio will be um, thursday 12th uh, january 7 p.m eastern and uh, friday uh 20th january 7 p.m eastern and we will um have the chat after the show number 155 so uh subscribe to our channel Celtic Stock Radio YouTube channel, uh, go to our pages, we will be in Celtic Science Forum and Celtic Stock Radio page, Celtic Stock Radio Twitter, Celtic Stock Radio Instagram, Celtic Stock Radio iTunes, or for the Celtic Stock Radio episodes, and those YouTube episodes of live video chats, you can find at Celtic Stock Radio YouTube channel, if you subscribe, this was episode number two, and of course, the links will be posted at Celtic Stock Radio Twitter account and Facebook page. That's all. The Celtics 3-0 streak and the Celtics are one and a half games behind Toronto and will play for the tie in Tuesday. The next show is uh, 12th, Thursday, uh, January 12th, 7 p.m. Eastern after uh, Toronto Raptors games and Washington Wizards game in uh, Washington. So until then, Danny and Igor are telling, are saying you good night and always root for the Celtics and thanks for support. We love you all. Okay, so again, let's hope for a nice win on Tuesday so we can finally say that we've gotten one of those big wins and this team can start uh, showing that they're uh, right there and capable basically of competing with the Toronto Raptors and they are the true number two team in the East. Yeah,